I'm here. Good morning, everybody. It is Tuesday, March 3rd, and I call this commission meeting to order. Those present are our interim proposed city clerk, Ms. Taylor, Ms. Hale, our recording secretary, Commissioner Hanks, Vice Mayor Luke, myself, Mayor McDowell, Commissioner Emmerich, City Attorney Ms. Layton, City Manager Mr. Lear, a lot of staff, citizens, officers, thank you all for being here. Um, at this time, I just want to remind everybody, make sure your phones are muted so we don't hear it ringing. If you have public comment, please make sure you fill out one of our public comment cards and hand it to the officer, so that way then I know when to call your name. At this time, I'd like to stand for the invocation given by Pastor, Mr. Pastor Jim Glazer from Atwater Community Church. It takes it just a second. And it it's got to warm up. It's awfully cold in here. Good morning. <laughs> Test. There we go. Good morning. Let's pray. Father, this morning we come to you in with a gracious attitude, an attitude of gratitude. And Lord, uh, it's just been brought to my attention that there are blood mobiles out there and many employees are giving blood. And Lord, we just wanna lift that situation up to you, Lord, that everything that is needed in these cases with the two that were severely injured, Lord, that uh, they would get the very utmost of care, that they would get all the blood, everything that you see fit that they need for, Lord, we ask for in Jesus' name. And Lord, we come to you this morning as I drive through this city during the week and just to be able to ride across Atwater, down Atwater and across Price Boulevard this morning, I just look around and I see all the building, all the prosperity, all the wonderful things happening in this city, Lord, and it just continues and grows People just keep coming, Lord, and we see your hand of prosperity on that. But, Lord, we're not naive. We know that it's a spiritual battle. We know that there's evil out there, Lord. If there wasn't, we wouldn't need our police. We wouldn't need our fire, our EMS. And so, Lord, uh, this morning I come here, Lord, you've given me three words. Wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And Lord, all of these are not from the world, not worldly, not anything we've learned in school. But Lord, these are things that you want us to have only by spending time with you and listening to your small, still voice so that the blessing can continue. And so Lord, I ask for this chamber this morning, wisdom, godly wisdom. I ask for godly knowledge, Lord. And I ask for all these things put together with godly understanding. And Lord, we lift up this morning our police, our fire departments, our EMS, everybody that serves in this great city, Lord. We pray play protection and blessing upon them. And Lord, we thank you for your presence here this morning in this chamber. And Lord, we ask for your Holy Spirit to guide and direct. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. <clears throat> At this time, I'd like to ask Ms. Kim Farrell, our finance director, to come lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Ms. Kim. <clears throat> Alrighty, at this time, could I please get a motion to approve the agenda as presented, unless there's anything that needs to be pulled? Move. Motion on the floor, I'll second. Got a motion by Commissioner Emmerich, second by McDowell to approve the agenda as presented. We'll go ahead and call the vote. <clears throat> Thank you, and that passed four to zero. All righty. 
And do we have any public comment cards? Uh, I've got Vice two Mayor? for the general. Fantastic. All righty. have two public comment cards. Uh, first one is uh, Mr. Scott Smith and then Ms. Catherine Prophet. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Scott Smith. I'm a police officer with the uh, city of Northport. And the reason I'm here today is because you're going to have a second reading from a request from Chief Garrison to reallocate some forfeiture funds to purchase outer carry vests for all the police officers in the city of Northport. And the reason I'm here is I would like to uh, hope that you would go ahead and approve that today. Um, on December 22nd, I suffered a injury in the evening when I slipped and fell and I had all my equipment on. And when I'm laying in my hospital bed <coughs> in January, I was there for 24 days, my neurosurgeon asked me what had happened. And I explained to him what I was doing at the time and how I had fallen and what I was wearing. He asked me where I was wearing my equipment and I told him it was on my, uh, my hips. And the first thing he said is that's not where you need to be wearing all of that weight. Well, my injury is pretty severe and I had surgery. I had actually four surgical procedures. And since then, I've had other complications as a result of that surgery. And I'm asking that you consider 100% reallocating all of those funds that are necessary to outfit every officer and all the future officers in this agency so they do not have to go through what I've been going through. Um, I don't know where my road's going, but I know that at least if we can possibly stop this kind of injury again for anybody, um, it's definitely going to be a positive thing. I can tell you that if you look at the cost factor of it, my 24 day stay in the hospital, the bill came out to almost $317,000. Again, um, I have spent another six days in the hospital as a result of this as well. So I've spent 30 days in the hospital since December 25th. So please take this seriously. It's, it's a needed thing to get this this weight off all these officers' hips. I've been a police officer for 24 years. I don't know if I'm going to be returning. And I don't want to see this happen to anybody else. I appreciate your time for that. Officer Smith, thank you for your powerful testimony and comments today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much appreciate it. And I'm so sorry that this wasn't done before that happened to you. And Godspeed and health to you. Thank you. Love you. Bless you. Uh, Ms. Catherine Prophet. Good morning. My name is Catherine Prophet. I'm an environmental biologist. I've been studying the Florida scrub jay for about 16 years. The Florida scrub jay is listed both federally and in the state of Florida as a species threatened with extinction. It's estimated that 90% of the population has already been lost over the last 100 years or so. Their numbers continue to decline due to human activity. The good news is that humans can reverse this trend with proper management of their habitat. The species lives only in Florida, and so only Floridians can save it. Where they live is vital to them. While many birds can live in nearly any type of habitat, the Florida scrub jay lives in a very limited habitat, the Florida scrub. They need the plants and animals that exist there and they need habitat in which they can be safest from predators and where they can perform their life strategy for survival. They're long-lived species, rather than one that mass produces, um, many young to perpetuate the species. Their offspring typically stay with the parents for a year or two before leaving home. They learn those survival skills during that time. When a pair forms, they typically stay together for life. This can be 10 years or more. They pick a home site and spend the rest of their lives there. They do not migrate. In fact, they only fly very short distances, even when a youngster is leaving home. It's not uncommon for a Florida scrub jay to spend its entire life within a mile of the nest that it hatched from. Any habitat that contains these birds is vital. Any habitat that once contained these birds is also vital because we then know that all of the required elements for their survival exist there as long as it's maintained. 
Southern Sarasota and Charlotte counties have a large population of these birds. And so I urge you to consider maintaining as much scrub as possible for the continued existence of this species. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very Appreciate well stated. Thank you. Appreciate your expertise. Are you going to stick around for the, okay. I know you did the last time too, so <laughs> thank you. At least you got to speak first this time instead of last. Is there any other public comment cards? Not for this section. And we'll just for later. For the record, too, I would like to acknowledge our former commissioner, Ms. Joan Morgan, who's in the house. Welcome, Ms. Morgan. Thank you for joining us. All righty. So we have announcements next. Ms. Uh, Taylor, if you could please. The current vacancies for the following boards and committees include the Art Advisory Board, Audit Committee, Beautification and Tree Scenic Highway Committee, Charter Review Advisory Board, Citizens Tax Oversight Committee, Community Economic Development Advisory Board, Environmental Advisory Board, Historic and Cultural Advisory Board, Joint Management Advisory Board, Northport Youth Council, Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, Planning and Zoning Advisory Board, Public Utilities Advisory Board, Zoning Board of Appeals. The upcoming expirations for the following advisory boards and committees, Art Advisory Board, Community Economic Development Advisory Board, Environmental Advisory Board, Northport Youth Council, Police Officers Pension Board of Trustees, Parks and Recreation Advisory Board, and Planning and Zoning Advisory Board. One Northport resident to serve on the Sarasota Manatee Metropolitan Plan and Organization Citizen Advisory Committee. If anyone would like more information, please see the City Clerk's Office. Thank you. Thank you. Um, at this time, we'll move on to consent. City Manager, has anybody pulled anything from consent? Just item C, the minutes. Mayor Thank you Zola. very much. I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda uh, as written, <coughs> but pulling C for discussion. Thank you very much. Second. I have a motion on the floor by Vice Mayor to approve consent agenda items A and B, seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. Anything to that? No. Commissioner no. Emmerich? We'll go ahead and take the vote, please. And that passed four to zero. Saving time, I just pulled those minutes because there is an error that I didn't see prior to them being placed on the agenda. If you go to page 11 of the minutes, it states Mayor McDowell agreed to send Ms. Taylor the email summarizing the Minnesota League of Cities meeting to provide to all uh, commissioners. I have no knowledge of the Minnesota League of Cities and their information. What I offered to forward was the email for the FLC, Florida League of Cities, call in summary update to the clerk and fellow commissioners. So I would like to see that change made um, instead of Minnesota League of Cities be Florida League of Cities call in summary update. <clears throat> so since it's go ahead I pass the gavel to vice mayor at this time I'd like to approve the minutes for January 14th with the following change um, the email of the Florida League of Cities call in summary update instead of the Minnesota League of Cities meeting. Do I hear a second? Second. All right. Uh, the motion has been made to adjust the minutes comments, taking it from Minnesota League to Florida League of Cities. Any discussion? And city clerk has the email um, with the change. Call the vote. And that is four to zero. Thank you, Passing Vice Mayor. Passing the gavel back. Thank you. And I will be more cognizant of getting those uh, uh, minutes read in a more timely manner. So thank you for that. Um, moving on to a presentation by the Certified Local Government Program with possible action regarding um, the CLG City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm going to ask Ms. Megan McDonald to give you the presentation that was recommended by our um, advisory board. Let's go from there. And ma'am, you do have 15 minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you. All right. 
Great. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Megan McDonald, um, and I work for the Florida Division of Historical Resources, which is the State Historic Preservation Office for the state of Florida. Every state in the United States has a State Historic Preservation Office, and the Division of Historical Resources serves that purpose here. So I am here to talk to you a little bit about the Certified Local Government Program and what it is and what it entails and how it might be helpful to the city of Northport and to answer any questions that you may have. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, just so you know, your folder has a copy of the PowerPoint presentation if you wanted to follow along, and it has some additional handouts that I'll describe as we go through. So first and foremost, what is a certified local government? Uh, Manatee County and Sarasota County and the city of Sarasota are all certified local governments, um, just to give you some local examples. Um, but these are communities who decided that they wanted to make historic preservation a local priority um, through enhancing their local historic preservation ordinance um, and making sure that their local historic preservation board met certain requirements and received regular training and support. Uh, the goal of the program is to uh, create a preservation partnership between the federal, state, and local governments um, and to really provide as much support as humanly possible to these local preservation boards. Uh, the program is administered through the State Historic Preservation Office where I work and also the National Park Service. And in the state of Florida, we currently have 77 certified local governments. All right, so let's talk about this a little bit more. What is a certified local government? It's a community that has passed a historic preservation ordinance that meets the requirements of the Florida CLG guidelines. It's a community that has an active historic preservation board. And it's a community that has simply applied to become certified through the State Historic Preservation Office and approved by the National Park Service. And once a community has become a certified local government, which I will refer to as CLG from here on out for the sake of brevity, once a community becomes a CLG, they have a number of benefits. So here on the left-hand side in the blue box, um, a couple things that I thought were important to mention. Certified local governments have certain grant benefits uh, when applying for grants through the Division of Historical Resources. And I'll talk about that in some more detail um, later in the presentation. CLGs uh, are regularly um, available um, to have training sessions um, for their historic preservation boards. In fact, I just did a training yesterday evening for the Manatee County Historic Preservation Board, so it was really great to get to meet all of those board members and talk about the historic preservation issues facing their county. Uh, CLGs um, have a direct line to the Division of Historical Resources through the CLG coordinator, through me. Um, so when you need technical assistance or resources related to particular preservation issues in Northport, um, I'm available to you. Um, and if I can't answer your question, I can connect you um, with folks in our division who can. And then lastly, uh, but a fairly important benefit of the CLG program is that you become a part of a, a greater network of historic preservationists, uh, both in Florida and in the United States. I mentioned that we have 77 CLGs in Florida. There are over 2,000 in the United States. Um, and through uh, the CLG listserv that we have at the state of Florida, um, your local um, historic preservation board would have access um, to these other communities who have historic preservation programs and kind of bounce ideas and ask questions from one another. In addition, um, communities that are CLGs have a formal comment role for National Register nominations that come through their jurisdiction. So if Northport had been a CLG last year, uh, when the Warm Mineral Springs nomination was going through the process, your local historic preservation board would have gotten to read that nomination before <coughs> anyone else, before it went before the state historic preservation board and offer their thoughts about the nomination and if they thought um, there were any issues that needed to be cleared up before it went before the state board. So that's a benefit that only CLGs have. And then also, if your, pro if your uh, local government has an ad valorem tax exemption program, uh, one benefit for CLGs is that they get to review those tax credit applications at the local level. It does not have to go to the state. All right, so once a community applies and becomes certified, becomes a CLG, what do they do? What is their job? So when we talk about the Certified Local Government Program at the local level, we're talking about your Historic Preservation Board, which I understand is called the Historic and Cultural Advisory Board here. Uh, that's the body that carries out the work of the CLG. So they do four major things. The first is that they identify and designate historic resources in your community. This is one of the most important things that they do. I just mentioned the National Register Program. 
uh, just to help clarify that program and how it differs from the local register of historic places, the National Register is strictly honorary. So it comes with no extra protections for properties once they're listed, simply honorary. When properties are locally designated, they're protected through your local ordinance, and any major changes that take place to those designated properties have to be approved by your Historic Preservation Board. So one of the responsibilities of your CLG, of your Historic Preservation Board, is to identify local historic resources that may be in danger of being lost, whether due to development pressures um, or neglect or otherwise, and going through um, the local designation process to protect them. The second responsibility of a CLG is to conduct design review of those local, locally designated structures. And when we talk about design review, really what we're talking about is protecting the historic character of these structures. Buildings can change. We need them to adapt to meet the needs of people who live there, uh, but we do want to also protect their historic character. So the local historic preservation board, they're not pretty policing these buildings. Their goal is not to enforce what they believe is good design. Their goal is to preserve the historic character of the structure, the character that made it historically significant in the first place. The third thing that a CLG does is to educate the public about historic preservation. This doesn't necessarily mean that the board is hosting conferences uh, with, within the local government um, to teach people about historic preservation, but at the very basic level, uh, the Historic Preservation Board should have information on the city website about how to designate properties, how to apply for a certificate of appropriateness, and so on and so forth. And then lastly, a certified local government uh, maintains an ongoing system of survey. So basically, your board members and your planning staff are keeping an eye out on the historic areas of your community and saying, you know, maybe we could do some things um, to honor this particular neighborhood or this particular structure, or we see that this area is being impacted by development. Perhaps we need to investigate the possibility of creating a locally designated district, so on and so forth. But that's what we mean by survey, is kind of paying attention to the resources that are out there um, and consistently um, looking for ways um, to protect them. All right, so I've talked about some pretty abstract concepts about the CLG program, so I thought I'd give you a couple examples of certified local governments in the state of Florida so that you can see that not every program is the same, that every community kind of enacts the program differently. So we're going to go largest to smallest. We're going to start with West Palm Beach. So West Palm Beach became a CLG in 1992, so their program's been in place for quite a while. They have a ton of locally designated properties and districts in their community. So they have 17 separate historic districts and 47 individually designated properties. And all of these properties, whether they're in a district or locally designated as an individual property, uh, there, any changes to those buildings are reviewed by the, the local historic preservation board. Their Historic Preservation Board has nine members. That's more than most uh, CLGs have. We just require five, uh, five Historic Preservation Board members, unless your community has a population of less than 10,000, in which case we allow three board members. Um, but West Palm Beach has nine members. Two of those members are people with um, a background in historic preservation. Two are lawyers, two are architects, and three are simply interested citizens. Um, the program itself is overseen by a historic preservation planner. Not every community has a separate planner devoted to historic preservation, uh, but West Palm Beach does. And that, I included a map here on the right-hand side where you can kind of see where all of their uh, locally designated districts and properties are located. So let's shift to a smaller CLG, a smaller um, CLG in the state of Florida. The city of Sanford became a CLG in 1997. They just have two historic districts, and then they have eight individually designated properties. Um, the orange district at the top is their commercial district, and the green district at the bottom is residential. They have five members on their board, which is comprised of a realtor, a lawyer, two planners, and an interested citizen. And their community, uh, their historic preservation board is also overseen by a historic preservation planner. All right, and then we'll continue to get smaller. So here we have the town of Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter was certified in 2001. They don't have any historic districts, and they just have seven individually listed uh, properties. So for that reason, because they don't have, uh, they all, don't always have a ton of work coming before them, a ton of proposed changes to historic structures, they've really focused on education as a board. And so on the right-hand side, I have um, two photos of a plaque program that they initiated. 
um, as a board. And so when a property is added to their local um, historic register, they're eligible for a plaque. And so the board um, initiated this program and processes the applications. And then they've also initiated an incentive program, um, a grant program for uh, potentially um, eligible properties to be listed on the local register um, as a way of incentivizing um, people to list their properties on the local register. In this community, um, the CLG is overseen by the principal planner. He doesn't necessarily have a background in historic preservation. He's kind of learned on the job um, while he's um, been in this role. And this is just an example of a community where um, a member of the, the planning staff in a pre-existing position oversees the program. All right, and then our last case study, the town of Bel Air, a very small community, um, was certified in 2014. Again, they don't have any historic districts, but they have 33 individual designations. They choose to meet four times per year because they don't typically have a lot of um, projects coming before their board. They have seven members, one of which is a historian, two of which are realtors, and four are interested citizens. And they're overseen um, by the town management analyst, who I think is kind of a jack of all trades and does a number of things with the community, um, but did not have a background in historic preservation previously. Um, again, kind of learned on the job and also asked us to come and provide training for her and for the board members. Uh, one of the things I want to mention um, based on the town of Bel Air, we require that CLGs meet four times a year. That's the minimum. Um, we don't um, expect all boards to be meeting on a monthly basis, um, but the, the minimum requirement is four meetings a year. All right, I mentioned previously that there are grant benefits um, for being a certified local government. Uh, at the Division of Historical Resources, we have two types of grants, small matching and special category. I'm not going to talk too much about special category at, at this moment because um, there are no benefits to being a CLG when applying to those grants, but those are for large-scale brick-and-mortar projects, archaeological research, and are for up to $500,000. Now, the small matching grants um, are for up to $50,000, and one of the benefits of being a CLG is that you actually don't have to provide a match. So you can apply, and if you um, are awarded the grant, uh, you're awarded $50,000 that you do not have to match. These grants can be used for historic resources surveys, national register nominations, planning documents, and educational materials. Um, and then a second benefit of being a certified local government is that you can actually apply for two small matching grants a year. No other um, community in the state of Florida can do that, only CLGs. All right, just to show you a couple examples of grant projects that certified local governments have produced using these grants. Um, on the left-hand side is the Town of Bel Air's Historic Resource Survey. They decided they wanted to survey their entire town um, to de determine when all of the different neighborhoods had been constructed, what types of architectural styles were present, and then also the report um, put forth some recommendations for future action. Uh, second from the left, we have the Gainesville Mid-Century Design Guidelines. Gainesville has a ton of mid-century modern um, structures in their community, and they wanted to create a document that put forth best practices for how to treat those mid-century modern resources. And so they created these design guidelines using a small matching grant. Then we have the historic St. Petersburg uh, Downtown and Waterfront Walking Tour Guide. This was just a walking tour guide that folks could pick up um, and walk around the city and learn about different historic resources um, that were around. Um, and this qualifies as an educational project. And then the last one here, the plaque with the little QR code beneath it, um, this was actually a really creative educational project that was produced using a small matching grant by the city of St. Augustine. And basically, um, you download an app on your phone, and you can walk around the city and scan these little QR codes. And you'll be taken to a page with all kinds of information and photos, historic photos, of the property, um, and was just kind of a creative take on an educational project. Another benefit of CLG status is training. So that's what I'm here doing and what I was doing in Manatee County yesterday. Um, but not only myself, but others at the division are available to come and train your historic preservation board. Members of the public uh, are always welcome to attend. And we try to cater those training sessions based on the needs of your communities. And then every two years, we also do large scale regional trainings. Uh, this past April, we held one of our regional trainings in Venice. Um, and so that was a really neat opportunity to, um, in those two days, get to see the historic resources of Venice um, and have folks from all different uh, CLGs in Florida come together and share ideas. 
And then also throughout the year, we always offer webinars, and I send information about those webinars out through the CLG listserv. I've already talked about this um, already, but we currently have 77 CLGs in Florida, and through that CLG listserv, um, there's a, all kinds of conversation taking place when folks are looking for ideas from other Florida communities or have problems or questions coming up. <coughs> Um, and so that's just a really great uh, benefit of the program. How to apply? I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of this. Um, it's outlined here, and you actually have a copy of the application in your folder. Um, and this application process is typically handled by um, someone in your planning office who's going to oversee it. Um, but the first step is to enact a historic preservation ordinance that meets our requirements to establish that board, and then to submit an application. And then after that, these last four bullet points are just the passing of the paper between me and the National Park Service. And then I'm also not going to get into the nitty gritty of the ordinance, but I can answer questions about that certainly. Um, but you have a copy of the ordinance review checklist that I use when folks apply to the program. And this contains all of the items that we want to see in that ordinance when you apply. Once you become a CLG, your responsibilities are pretty minimal. We just want you to keep that ordinance in place and let us know when you're going to make changes to it. We want that board to be meeting at least four times a year. If staffing changes, so if the contact in the local government changes, we want to be notified. Um, and then basically for reporting, we require a three-page annual report every fall. And then we want you to submit your uh, Historic Preservation Board's meeting minutes and agendas. All right. That was the quick 15-minute overview of the Certified Local Government Program. Do you all Thank have you. questions for me? Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, Vice Mayor Luke. You were very thorough. <laughs> I hope I didn't talk too fast. I was no, very cognizant you did. of the 15-minute. <laughs> you did great. In fact, you answered just about every question I had in the last great. 60 seconds. <laughs> oh, great. There we go. Uh, so the final question that I had was, criteria to become a historical city? I mean, mm -hmm. is it just one thing that's named historical? Is how, you know, is the criteria? Because I noticed some didn't have districts, but they had single units. So if we have at least one single unit, like Warm Mill Springs, we can be a city? I mean, technically, you're not required to have local designations. So when you apply, if you don't have any local designations, we're not talking about national register designations, if you don't have any, that's not an obstacle to you applying. Uh, most communities do um, create those local designations because otherwise they won't really, there will be no purpose to their board existing because there won't be projects for them to review. Um, those communities that I mentioned, like Jupiter and Bel Air, that didn't have a ton of local designations, have chosen to focus on education. So there are certainly things the board can focus on. But the, to answer your question, no, you don't have to have any local designations when you apply. But we would certainly encourage you to, because that's the only way that you can protect your local resources. Thank you. Anybody else have any lights on? Seeing none, I do have two questions. All right. Is there a cost to being a CLG? There is not. No. My kind of my kind of program. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then I remembered way back when I first got elected, we had done a local registry. Mm -hmm. um, we had city attorney, you might have to help me with this. We created some kind of process to have buildings placed on a local <laughs> registry. And I am wondering if that would help with the CLG. If you did have a, a, a process in place already in your, in your historic preservation ordinance for creating those local designations, that's one of the requirements of the ordinance. So that would definitely help you that you already have it in place. So the local registry is, is separate than the national registry, yes. but they're... Um, they're part and parcel to it. They're Some properties are listed on both. Okay. So Warm Mineral Springs may be on your local register, and therefore um, any major changes to the property would have to go before your Historic Preservation Board, and then it's also on the National Register. So, and I know that it's very difficult for you to answer this because you don't know the exact terms and, and conditions of our, our local historical um, and cultural board that we just created. Would that work, or would we have to go back and possibly tweak it to become a, a CLG to make sure we meet 
the criteria that you, <coughs> you would very likely have to make some tweaks to the ordinance in order to meet the checklist unless you were using it when you created the ordinance in the first place and that ordinance includes um, your guidelines for the historic preservation board um, so what I can do and what I usually do when folks express interest in applying to the program is I'll evaluate the ordinance that exists and send you a copy of that checklist with my notes so that you'll see exactly what items you're missing um, and if there are any uh, items that are in conflict uh, with the program that would need to be adjusted. So I can do that in advance so that you would already know um, what kind of changes would need to take place. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And you're I did welcome. appreciate your presentation. Thank you. All righty. Um, anybody want to make a motion or give direction since there's a presentation or just move on? I'm opening it up. Reason to. Yeah, I, I think this is excellent to take the committee that we have currently and mm -hmm. form them into this. The, the benefit of belonging to it, to me, really jumps out at you. Even, you know, even, and, and what I was saying is even if we don't have, so, I mean, just the educational aspect to it, to me, is far worth it. So, I mean, I see no reason to not have a direction to do something with this ordinance. Being able to get grants and things like that, um, I, I would like Even to see us we'll go see. this into toward this direction. Uh, Commissioner Carason, your light is on. I'm ready for a motion. Does anybody else have anything to add prior to the motion? Go ahead, Commissioner Carason. Move to direct staff to work with the, um, what's it called? CLG. CLG to uh, become a member as well as bring back alternation alterations needed to our local ordinance. Second. A motion on the floor as stated by Commissioner Carason, seconded by Vice Mayor Luke. Anything to that, Commissioner Carason? I just think that this is uh, a wonderful thing. And uh, I hope that we can expand upon our historical and cultural uh, aspects of, of this city. I think that a lot of it is disappearing before our very eyes. And that thank you, Joan, for collecting the majority of it. And um, it's only up from here, folks. I think it's great. And Vice Mayor? Yeah, we need to start grabbing hold of our history and hanging on to it. We're at that point in time with the city being established and growing. We've got to grab hold of it. So start it now. And that way we can only add to it in the future as we gain in age. Thank you. I couldn't agree more. Um, and I'm glad that uh, we, we got a motion on the floor because I, I was going to pass the gavel and make one. Um, this is very important. While we're only 60 years old, there are cities that are much older than us, and I think this is very wise of us to get this started now before everything is lost. And 100 years from now going, why didn't they do anything? So um, I'm really glad to see this happen, and thank you. Um, seeing no other speaker lights, we'll go ahead and take the vote. <coughs> And that passed five to zero. Thank you very much for the presentation and thank you to the Historical Advisory Board. This was your recommendation that we do this presentation and I think it was very beneficial. So thank you. All right. Moving on to the next presentation, which is on the GovQA customer portal. Um, City Clerk, I'll turn it over to you. I'm just going to turn it over to Becca Clifford, and it looks like she has CJ in case you have any questions, but she's just going to provide an overview of the customer side of the portal for you. Thank you so much. And you have 15 minutes, ma'am. All right. Well, good morning. I'm here to give a presentation on the overview of our public records portal. Uh, we launched our online public records request system, GovQA, back in April of 2019. Um, it is the system used for all public records requests. We can uh, manage all requests within the same system. Um, each request is uh, 
itemized with its own reference number, therefore notifications uh, between customers and staff are contained within each request. Um, the system can be customized with its own workflows and processes. Um, the, there are several benefits for customers regarding our system. It is very easy to get to. Um, several links direct from our city's website. Um, under the, or next to the top searches, customers can click on the word records. That will take them to the public portal. Um, in the website, the green space down below, customers can click on public records request to reach the portal. There's also another link on our city clerk page customers can click on make a public records request. This is the online public records center. This is what customers see when they log into um, or click the link to make a public records request. Um, we have our home page here. We can submit records, submit a records request. You can review the public archive. You can search a request by reference number and you can also view um, the requests that have been you have submitted or customers submitted, they can view and track their requests. To submit a require records request, you can click on the public records menu or the large button in the middle of the page, submit a request. Um, currently, you can choose from police records request or city records request. Um, <coughs> within the records type that you choose. There are some other options you can choose to narrow down what it is you're looking for, such as city requests. There are options for building documents, emails, fire reports. There's also within each request type a free, um, free box, free text box, where customers can add information to the request um, that they're looking for, such as dates, um, names or specific addresses um, that they're wishing to have records on. Returning customers can log in. Um, you can always request a temporary password if you forget one. New customers can create an account. You can also submit records requests anonymously. Once you submit your records request, you would click on My Record Center. From here, customers can track their requests, they can view requests, they can view their invoices, they can also edit and update their customer account information. Search by reference number, this is beneficial for our anonymous customers. They too can log in, or I'm sorry, track, look at their review their request with, by entering the reference number that they receive once they submit a request. Our public records archive is now been implemented. Um, city requests only responsive records pertaining to um, emails, calendars, minutes, ordinances, resolutions, um, also uh, agreements and contracts are now available in our public ar archive. Um, so customers can go and review our archive or if they're searching for a certain um, for minutes or emails that we have already received that request, they will be deflected to our public archive so they can review the responsive documents. To review public records archive documents, customers can search by keyword, um, they can search by a request number and provide a uh, create date range um, if they know that. And they can also just review the list of the public archive that's already been published. Um, under the details tab, customers can download documents one at a time, or they can download all of the responsive documents that have been published. Currently, um, since our January 20th, 28th, 2020, uh, new public records policy went into, or was approved, went into effect. So we've done some updates to our customer notification, the verbiage that goes out um, to reflect the changes in the policy. Um, in February 2020, that is when we implemented the public records archive and we went back to January, all records that were closed from January 1st, 2020 to current. Um, for future updates, we are currently um, in the testing phase for our online payments. 
Um, we are, uh, again, currently we've, we're just taking steps to do the testing process. Everything seems to be going well. We're looking at a target date of implementation, <clears throat> excuse me, March 23rd, 2020. Fingers crossed, no, <laughs> no big roadblocks come up. Um, in April, I believe in April 2020, police records request, <clears throat> excuse me, will be going, police departments moving to their own online system. So we will be implementing a link to their new record system um, as a deflection from ours. Um, there shouldn't be customer interruption. They will also be providing for my understanding, online payments as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and we are working on <clears throat> the laser fish deflection um, for our minutes, ordinances, resolutions, agreements, and contracts. Um, that is still in process. I am helping on that project, so I don't have um, I'm not the point person. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, so I'm not the point person on that, but we are working on it. And once that is complete, um, we will be integrating that deflection into GovQA as well. So if you're searching for any of those items, um, you will be linked to LaserFish. And that's my presentation. Any questions? <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Or I have just one. Vice Mayor? What do you mean by deflection? Um, I'm not understanding what you're doing between laser fish and Pro Phoenix. Um, what it's going to do for, for the police department deflection, they call it deflection. Um, because we have the police department on board with GovQA currently, right. um, once they are online, we are going to transition into when you click for police public records, it will deflect customers to their online site. It will link them to their site. So it'll take them there so they can submit records requests. So it will know if it's a police request. And right. It will automatically send it to Pro Phoenix. Correct. And with um, LaserFish, my understanding is we have uh, the, again, they call it deflector. So if someone wants, types in minutes, those keywords, minutes, ordinances, a box will pop out and say, you can search our minutes ordinances here. They would click the button and it would direct them to the laser fish link. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any new other speakers? I just have a couple questions. Um, you're saying that the deflection is going to work with the police department. What about for the GovQA? What do you mean? So if, if somebody says, types in, um, I want to see McDowell's travel, will it pop up that somebody else already requested it and then they can see it right there and they don't even have to do a request because it's already Correct. there? Um, what is posted on the public archive is basically a summary of the customer's request. So if someone is asking for uh, McDowell's travel January 2018, um, if someone types in the word travel, or McDowell, though they would get a side deflector will pop up and say, "Could does any of this match your request? They could review that, and if it's there, they could just click on there, get the information without having to submit a second request. So is that already activated? Yep. Okay. Yes. Fantastic. Um, how long? So let's say I make a public records request. You all send the documents. It's a long, big, drawn-out document. How long is that link to that document or that information going to be available? Does it expire? Do I have to, if? Well, our, our public records um, requests have our one-year retention. Um, currently, we have the system set for so many downloads. I believe it's about 20 downloads. We've, we've changed it to 20. I, Based on the contract that we have with GovQA, we are afforded so many downloads um, for our contract before we begin getting charged. So we've kind of set a limit. There is no limit, however. If a customer cannot retrieve their document, they are um, directed just to contact us and we just resend it out. Um, it's online through the public portal, through their request center for 30 days. It is also, if it's a public, um, 
a published public records request, which we are working with uh, GovQA on. I believe it's out there until we retention and we purge it for the year. So I'm trying to think of an example. If I requested my travel mm -hmm. and you sent it to me and I never looked at it for 35 days. Is that gone then? No, it's not gone. We've just, it's just been suspended, so to speak. So when you go to look at it, it's 35 days and you click on it, it's just going to tell you that um, it's expired and to contact us. What we do then is just reset it. The idea is just to avoid customers downloading the same document 15 times. Okay. We're sending them the document so they can download it, save it, print it, keep it without having to keep going into the record center and download, download, download. So what happens if a citizen paid, and I don't know if this happens now that we changed it to the 30 minutes, but let's say a citizen had to pay $25 for whatever research time and documentation, does that then also expire, or is that available to them forever because they basically paid for it? Once they paid to, for it, it's, it too is available for, we have currently set it for 20, 20 downloads and 30 days. Um, it, it will be available throughout retention. We just would have to re-release it or reset the download counter. So if somebody paid the $25 and it was day 35, Mm -hmm. They would just contact you and say, hey, I, I didn't see it. I need you to resend it. They're not yep. going to have to pay it again, are they? No, 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 no. No, okay. we just reset it. Within that specific request, we just reset the download counter, and it, it just opens it back up on the portal for them to download again. Fantastic. Looking forward to seeing the online payment. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good luck with that. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody? Uh, Commissioner Carson. Yeah, real quickly, uh, one of the things is is that how do we know that people have actually paid for the request? Because when we get the report, it seems like there's some extensive investigation that would be required, but yet it doesn't look like persons are paying for that investigation. And that's, that's number one. And number two, how do you even determine how much time and, and what the charge is? Uh, well, currently we go by policy, which is 30 minutes right. of labor time processing. Um, and each department has to determine that themselves. For myself, such as an email request, request for emails. Mm -hmm. I can usually review emails, uh, 100 emails in 15 minutes. So based on the search I do, the total number of emails I get out of that search, I can then guesstimate an estimate. Um, customers are sent estimates to agree to. If they agree to it, we continue processing. Um, if it's over $50, they have to pay a deposit before we continue processing. Um, once the work is done, after they've agreed to it, the work is done, then they are sent their final invoice for payment. Documents aren't released until they pay. So is there a way to get, you know how it says uh, assigned or fulfilled, is there any way to say, you know, um, estimate sent? We have, it's a status that we have within the request. So when an estimate gets sent to a customer, within the request it changes the status to estimate set. What you see on your reports, I don't know if it shows that, it unless it's particularly in that status. Um, yeah. I don't know what it would entail to create these reports. That's what we have to do is create these records mm. to send to you. Okay, which I is, thought it was as simple as mm -hmm. just copying a screenshot and sending it off. Okay. No. Um, I just, I, I guess that if anyone was to look at the public records and the emails, it would assume, it, you know, when they looked at it at glance, it would seem like everybody's not paying Mm -hmm. you know I understand. What I mean? And that's my concern is that people are paying. People are paying. And yes. we don't want others to say, well, that person didn't pay and this one, and why should I? Mm -hmm. So, anyways, that was just my take. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor? Uh, my final question is um, Are you the only one still working on all this stuff? For the most part, yes, ma'am. Has there been cross training? 
We are working on it. Currently, while I am in the process of um, getting online payments on board, I have to do some separate testing in that, so we have recruited one of our other staff to help fulfill records. Um, okay. But we you. are in the process of um, creating some, some uh, cross-training with other, and I have a backup when I am not here. Cynthia uh, Kelly is my backup, so she will do um, records requests. Good job, because that's uh, yeah, she's in yeah. records. That's her job. Uh, is there only mm -hmm. the two in records currently, Cynthia and Cynthia Becca? Cynthia and Becca, yeah. So the only two in the record. That that's their job. Okay, yes, so you guys right. can back each other up, mm -hmm. and there's been the cross training for Cynthia and everything. For Cynthia and other staff as well other have been staff helping too, out. Other staff too, in yes. case something happens. Okay, that's vitally important because I think some of the bog down that we had, ancient past, um, you were low man on the totem pole being put up on the top. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Uh, one final question, yeah. um, and Commissioner Carison, thank you for prompting it. Um, when you accept payments, whether it be online or in person, um, does the city clerk's office keep track of how much they're collecting? And We currently, with this new fiscal year, we've had a specific line item budget um, for all of our public records. So we've got a, a separate account for all public records. Um, I'm not going to say revenue is really not, <laughs> but all record, public records request monies that come in goes into this specific account. Um, some of the reporting, and that's what we're looking into now with online payments, is pulling the proper reports from the system to show um, what we've taken in. What we're having issues with is just separating estimates versus invoices versus what's, what is actually paid. But we do have that separate account. So in the police department is um, using that same account. So all public records requests are going to that account. Fantastic. That's good to hear. That way then you can see, um, you know, it's not just the labor part of it. It's like the CDs and the copies mm -hmm. and stuff too. Okay. Correct. Fantastic. Appreciate that. Any other speakers? City clerk, did you want to weigh in? Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ms. Becca. And thank Ms. UJ, thank you. Thank you. All right. And we will move on to first reading, um, amending the code to eliminate the citizen opt-in program for utilities. I need a motion to read by um, title only, please. So moved. Second. Got a motion by Commissioner Hanks, seconded by Commissioner Carousel. We'll go ahead and take the vote. I made the motion. She seconded. The other way around. And that's actually okay. Just want to make sure. <laughs> Thank you very much. And that motion passed five to zero. City clerk, please. The ordinance of the City of Northport, Florida, amending the code of the City of Northport, Florida to eliminate the citizen opt-in program under the Cross-Connection Control Program by amending Section 78-129 Cross-Connection Control Program, providing for adoption, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, providing for coding, and providing an effective date. Thank you, City Clerk. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Um, back in October, we had a meeting where we discussed this Cross-Connection Control Program, commonly referred to as BECFLO and the opt-in program and, our, and the struggles we have had um, in the recent history with that. Our utilities department is here if you have any questions, but this ordinance was drafted to eliminate the opt-in program that we've been unable to get people to participate in. Uh, so with that, we have staff ready to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, city manager. Does anybody have any questions about this uh, elimination of this program? Seeing none, I do have one. Um, how will the residents how many residents per currently participate in this program? Mike Bulo, field operations manager. Um, currently, there are uh, 15,000 in the backflow program. How many are in the opt-in program? The opt-in is about 8,000, roughly. 8,600, maybe, I think the number is. I'm, I'd have to 
It's around 8,000. Okay, We're so in the original opt-in program. So figuring 8,000 participate in the opt-in backflow program. Correct. That was once, in the initial setup of the program, yes, for the backflow. Once this ordinance goes to second reading and assuming it's going to pass, mm -hmm. what steps are being taken to advise and notify these 8,000 users that this is not going to be available anymore and that they're on their own? Um, we, we do have an insert that will be going in all utility bills that explains the uh, opting out of the opt-in program, what the requirements are, and their option that they can go to a dual check now. Um, and I, if you'd like me to read it, I can. It, it, would, it explains it. Uh, it says, attention residential customers with an existing backflow prevention device. device. Residential devices requirements have changed according to the Florida Department of Environmental Protection Rule 6255.360. Authorization from the Utilities Department for the replacement of your current device with a non-testable in-ground dual check device may be requested if none of the following hazards exist on the property. An active well, an auxiliary reclaim, an irrigation system conducted, an irrigation system connected to the utilities distribution system. Please note the replacement must be completed at the property's owner expense by a certified technician and in compliance with the city building code and administrative codes. And the dual check device is subject to mandatory replacement every five years. So if the hazard, uh, if you, one of the hazards listed on the property, you must have an above ground testable device and then it's for information called the field office. So. The, these will go out and um, we, we will add the verbiage on there. It's not on this one. We, we will add the verbiage on that for the opt-in is no longer. Yeah, because when you were reading that, I'm sitting there going, okay, where's, where's yes. this? I, we, we did talk about that um, and we will add that on. Yeah, this. because if 8,000 uh, 8, customers currently use this opt-in program, they're going to get that and go, doesn't apply to me. The city takes care of it. Right. That really, really needs to be an educational campaign for the users to understand it's, their deadlines now. Not right. just that they have other options, but they have deadlines now that they're responsible for. Right. So thank you for reading that because I yes. think your light bulb went off at the same time mine did. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Okay. Um, I appreciate that. and. Maybe by the time it gets to second reading, we can see that updated verbiage yes. um, with the notification. And it, maybe that notification just goes to those 8,000 or whatever customers. Well, yeah, we would send it out to everybody that's opted in the backflow and in all the utility customers in general that are connected Thank with you. backflow. Seeing no other speaker lights on, we'll go ahead and get a motion, please. Thank you. Uh, this is ordinance number 2020-02. All right. Uh, move to continue ordinance number 2020-02 for second reading on March 24th. I have a motion on the floor by Vice Mayor to approve 2020-02 to second reading, continue it to second reading on March 24th, and that was seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. Anything to that? No, ma'am. Commissioner Emmerich? No, ma'am. All right, we'll go ahead and take the vote, please. And that passed, five to zero, thank you. Moving on to ordinance number 2020-13 regarding the Community Economic Development Advisory Board membership um, regulations or requirements. I need a motion to read by title only, please. So moved. Second. A motion on the floor to read by title only by Vice Mayor Luke, seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. Anything to that? No, ma'am. Commissioner Emmerich? No, ma'am. Go ahead, please. We'll take the vote. And that passed five to zero. City clerk, please. Ordinance number 2020-13, an ordinance of the city of Northport, Florida, amending the code of the city of Northport, Florida, section 4-151, regarding the membership of the Economic Development Advisory Board, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, providing for codification, and providing an effective date. 
Thank you very much, City Clerk. Uh, City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, as you know, recently we had a, a commission meeting and you gave direction based on a request by your Community Economic Development Advisory Board to change their membership numbers and requirements. Um, and commission gave direction to bring back an ordinance to make those changes happen. What those include are increase in the number of certain classifications, specifically the financial services from one member to two, real estate from one to two, combine the Northport resident with HOA to one group entitled citizen with two members, and expand the definition of tourism to include sports and entertainment. Uh, we have worked with the city attorney's office to prepare the ordinance that you have in front of you. And with that, I'm ready to answer any questions you may have. If I may, there are a couple of other changes that were directed by the board to remove a reference to a Northport City Commissioner that's sitting on the board and to remove a reference to a county commissioner um, serving as an ex officio non-voting member. In the list of, uh, of possible members, there is no change to a reference to a school board member. You all did not address that, but that is another elected member that's allowed on the board as in, in our current code and in this ordinance as well. Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner <coughs> Carson, please. Yeah, I, I don't remember the Sarasota County Commissioner or even school board being removed from the um, position. I thought it was only our city of Northport because it's our advisory board. I mean, the direction from the board was to remove the elected Sarasota County Commissioner and allow a, a representative of the county oh, to be on the board in its place. It so the proposed language is okay. a change to read an unelected Sarasota County representative may serve as an ex officio. But no elected member, I believe, is what you're saying. Correct. Right. Uh, okay, that makes sense. And then I would assume we would have to do the same for the school board is essentially what you're saying so that we're consistent or at least. Yeah, it's your board. You can do what you want, but I wanted to bring it to your attention because a lot of the discussion of the board last time was about elected members not serving. And when I went in to revise it is when I noticed the school board member was listed up in an earlier portion of the code language. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Does anybody else wish to ask questions? Seeing none, I do have one question, um, and maybe city manager, you can answer it. On line 70, it says an, elect, an unelected Sarasota County representative may serve as an ex officio non-voting member. Uh, wouldn't we need to add in there something about with written permission from the county administrator? So that way then he's aware of his staff serving on this board? I don't think it's a bad idea. I'm, what's running through my head is trying to figure out if our ordinance wants to direct how his staff behaves. I don't, you know, that's the current requirement of the current county administrator. The next one, you know, whenever that may be, may not require such a thing. It's just, it's, that I believe is a requirement that he would put on his staff or she, um, whatever the county administrator. And, and I, I see both ways, it's, but. It's certainly a courtesy. That's but where I was looking. it's courtesy that it's actually the requirement of him and his staff. Our ordinance, I don't know, should put requirements on how his staff behaves with him. Um, I, I just was looking at it more of a courtesy thing because he may have, because this, sometimes the board meets, you know, this board actually meets in the morning. Um, and so this way he's aware that his staff may be late. That's all. I was just doing it out of courtesy as where I was going with it. But if you don't see that being necessary, being an administrator, you know. I wouldn't, I don't, I don't believe it's necessary in a code like this. I think, like say, I, it's a courtesy. I don't think it's a requirement to be in the code. And that's right. how his staff would behave with him. Gotcha. All right. Uh, Commissioner Carasone, you're late back on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for bringing that back up. Uh, the, uh, I guess that's where I was going with it. I thought that our decision to have to take out non-elected positions was more due to the fact that we didn't see them coming and that we wanted an option that whether it be an elected uh, 
county commissioner or a representative of the Sarasota County government. At least that's kind of how I took it. Uh, maybe it wasn't clarified very well, but I would think that that's more along the lines of what we'd like to see. I mean, of course, we'd have to find out, but I, I mean, maybe the, the representative should be an elected official, and if not, then, then whoever their plan B is, and the same with the school board. Um, I hate the idea of taking out the elected official, because if it is, you know, maybe they want to be here. And I specifically mentioned from the county level possibly having an elected official because of our growth and, and how beneficial that might be as a regional perspective. But the direction was no with that. Hmm. And I think you were the one that voiced a no. <laughs> I wouldn't doubt it. It was probably late. <laughs> Listen, there's there's no saying what I do. Um, so I guess that uh, if it was me, then I'd like to change the mind. Because <laughs> I'm female and I get to do that. <laughs> uh, Vice Mayor. I didn't say that. I think being consistent with all elected officials whenever, I mean, when we had the problem with one of our own sitting on there, it's because that one voices their opinion, their feeling. And so it's the same thing whether it's a county uh, elected official, a school board elected official, you're getting the viewpoint of just that one. If you have a representative coming from the county or from the school board, they're speaking just as though our staff would from a city level, not from one, one viewpoint of one elected official. I'd love to say that's true, but in the past when we've had um, county representatives serving on boards, then it's usually their own independent thought and um, doesn't equal what the commission as a whole believes. Um, we've had that issue in the past. And then the other issue is that sometimes you'll have it where you'll have a uh, representative and every time there's a communication, they'll say, we can't take a position until I bring it before my commission can't take a position, you know, so it could also hinder the process. I'm just looking for maybe the option to be open so that if an elected official does not want to come and serve, then any representative of the county or school board would have the option to serve. And, and as far as the difference between our city officials serving on this board versus a county or school board, this is our advisory board. Um, to me, having a city official sit on it is a little bit of a too much internal persuasion, possibly. And uh, where on a with a Sarasota County uh, board member or even a school board member, it, it's our advisory board. So there's no internal. I understand what you're yeah, saying, what I mean. but, but I have sat in meetings with elected uh, county commissioners and they've stated their opinion. Mm -hmm. And then the, the mm -hmm. consensus of what happens within the meeting is the opposite of what they presented. So myself, I like it being a little more pure. And if the staff has to stay, I can't take a stand on that yet. There hasn't been a decision. Well, that's the truth. You know, you wait and you talk about it when they actually can take that stand instead of throwing out um, projections or just their thoughts or opinions. Uh, those can be discussed by anybody. But it takes on a little different... My idea. ...your idea if it's coming from an elected official. My idea with the purpose of an elected official, especially from outside of our board. You know, obviously we hear from this board, so you know, they're our advisory board. And my idea was <clears throat> that it brings a little bit of education to the county level of, of what is going on down here as the fastest growing community, uh, not only in the county, but kind of in the state. You know, um, the largest community in our county, I think it is very important that um, that, the, that the county knows what is going on down here. Um, and my, my... So you wanted to educate them. 
Yeah, it's more for an education aspect to allow. I mean, obviously, if a commissioner does not want to sit on it, they don't have to. But if they so choose to, then our then our ordinance allows for that. So can we so get can we an input our speaker from, lights, please? Can we, can we use get some input from Mel? If she's available, I think that uh, and city manager, if Miss Mel is available, and seeing that there's the discussion, I'm I, I as the member that was on the board as a non-voting member for the commission. Um, it was stated that I could have undue influence on the board. Mm -hmm. By far was that ever what I was doing. I was using my role as an education component to the board to fill in where we were on certain things. Um, if that undue influence could happen at the commission level here in the city, I would firmly believe that that undue influence could happen with the county commissioner serving or even a school board serving. So I think it should stay pure, Commissioner, uh, Vice Mayor Luke's word, and keep it as a staff person and it's, it's an advisory board. County commissioners, county school board members are welcome to come to any meetings and any advisory board meetings, read the minutes if they don't wanna come down here to see what is happening in our city. So that's my take on it. And city manager, I believe Ms. Mel is ready. Yes, ma'am. If she would like to weigh in on it <laughs> or not. <laughs> Mel Thomas Please, for the yes. record, and I'm politically savvy enough to say I could go either side, either way on this one. <laughs> yeah. Good answer. <laughs> so have you, have you sat in on um, meetings, say, with the chamber of that and representatives <clears throat> from county and other organizations have represented very well within those boards uh, the entity that they come from? Um, Commissioner, Vice Mayor, that would be absolutely accurate. I have sat in on meetings where that has been the case. Um, elected officials bring a different perspective, obviously. Um, I think they have garnered tremendous amounts of information that when put together differently than sometimes people sitting at the cluster of a table don't always have the advantage of having. I think that helps in nuanced ways um, inform the entire group. Um, I, I have also seen it go terribly awry and heavy handed comments uh, frighten off um, a, a more, a, a less vocal set of participants they don't want to come up against, um, and, and, and they run the, in, in a particular business, I think businesses are afraid that they will run up against something negative uh, if they ever have to do business with government. I think that's ill-placed fear, but that is, I think, what does permeate sometimes. So again, I, I really do kind of feel like I'm coming off of both sides of the shop. I've seen advantages. Uh, Mayor, to your point, you've always been nothing but uh, above board, and you always back off when necessary. I've never seen you do anything that was um, that I would consider heavy-handed. Uh, on the other hand, we might end up one day with someone who sits who's not able to do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Ms. Mel. Seeing no other speaker lights, I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion uh, to continue ordinance number 2020-13 for second reading on March 24th, uh, changing the elected board member school board member to also a representative from the school board in when because it says higher education or school board member so wording it the same way that it is for the others making it consistent thank you non-elected correct thank you motion on the floor do i hear a second second motion by vice mayor uh, to approve, to continue ordinance 2020-13 to March 24th for second reading, changing 2C to be higher education or school represent school board non-elected representative. And that was seconded by Commissioner Carasone. Anything to that, Vice Mayor? No, I'm good. Thank Commissioner you. Carasone? Um, thank you, Mel, for kind of changing my thought process. I really didn't think about the whole uh, possibility of, of
being um, swayed or concerned with a elected official there of any sort. So uh, I'm okay with it the way it is. Thank you. Seeing no other comments, go ahead and take the vote. There, it appears. And that passed five to zero. Thank you. All right. Um, and moving on to second reading for ordinance number 2020 12. This is the budget amendment. Um, City Clerk, could you please read by title only? Ordinance number 2020-12, an ordinance of the City of Northport, Florida, amending the non-district budget for fiscal year 2019-20 by providing for changes identified in Exhibit A to transfer $8 million from the sewer capacity fee fund balance for a developer reimbursement related to the construction of a wastewater treatment plant and $82,000 in the forfeiture fund from confiscated property for operating supplies and a donation for teen court, providing for findings, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. Thank you very much, City Clerk. Uh, City Manager, I know this is second reading. Is there anything? Yes, to... there are a couple things I'd like to address. Thank you. Um, one is I had asked you all that we'd have the letter and information about teen court being back on March 24th. Well, staff moved heaven and earth and we got it, so it's attached as Exhibit B to this. So we were able to get this done. That's why you had the agenda amended um, to add that. Teen Court is eligible. We got more information to what the, some of the programs they have. One of the things I also wanted to, to have for you is um, we all heard the public speaker, Sergeant Smith, um, in the unfortunate situation that he's been dealing with. So I asked one of our officers, the chief, to grab one of our officers. You could actually see what these new vests, outer vests, look like that they're looking to purchase. Um, <laughs> I had a request after the public speaker of how do they wear the equipment? And you can see the extreme difference between where they wear it around their waist, whereas this outer vest actually. And I think holds. the monitor is kind of blocking. Yeah. So you could be a model today, aren't yeah. you? <laughs> Welcome to the runway. And you need so this. Yeah, yeah tw twirl around back. so we see the back. <laughs> okay, <laughs> check it out. <laughs> 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 Folks, folks, it's really <laughs> <laughs> HR. This is this. <laughs> the uh, short straw. Okay, so if, could you move your hands, please? Okay, so you still have you still have your weapon and taser still on your hips, correct? You still have a belt, yes. Okay, so what is on the other side then? I'm sorry. On this side, I'm carrying just the tourniquet. What's that? Oh, a tourniquet. Sorry. Sorry. I have a tourniquet. I have a Narcan pouch that some of my bridges just to carry my Narcan in the vehicle. And a couple ounces of nitrate to get some cuts on the belt. That's just for compression. But the only major issue I have is still on my waist is my pistol. Everything you stated I'm you purchased the Narcan? No. The Narcan just hey. to carry the case. Oh, because they for the. Make a okay. Um, don't go anywhere in case anybody else has any questions. Um, Vice Mayor Luke, your light is on. I don't have a light. I, want, I wanted to say thank you for getting everything done for teen court. I really feel as though that okay. needed to be done. So thank you for the edification or education that went on so that this could be addressed. Um, but along the lines of this choice, choice A, choice B for preferencing. Um, can, can the police department offer a variety of choices that are more comfortable to them for the Narcan? And what about secondary vests? I mean, do they get dirty? Do, I mean, how do you launder them? How do you care for them? Todd Garrison, police chief. This is just an outer carrier um, Best. So the ballistics in the outer carrier can also be worn, conceal, uh, concealed underneath the uniform. 
it's the same panels. So yes, that can be washed. You take the, the ballistics out and the vest can be washed in the laundry. So the Kevlar is also in the outer vest that he is it's, wearing or is he wearing that separate? So he takes the vest off, the, the, the ballistic panels are inside that vest panel. Oh, okay, so it's not set. Okay. And that whole panel just slides right in and you can wash it, take the panel out. Okay. You can wear it underneath the uniform right. like that. You can still put it on. Fantastic. Since we're asking So if we have a, some type of like of a formal dress, whatever, and they wanted to wear their body armor underneath their shirt for some reason, they, they can still do that. They don't have to wear that. How many it's, officers have those kind of vests as opposed to the... So just to be transparent, um, we had to call someone that was wearing the outer carrier vest. This is not the exact model that we're going to, but it gives you the visual display of how this stuff will be attached to... Did you vest. purchase that yourself? Yes, I did. I met another gentleman who did. So the vests that we're going are, are very, very similar to this, except we're going to have a Molly system up farther, so these pockets aren't here, all going to be Yeah, you'll have to grab a microphone <laughs> right down there on the table. See what happens when the chief gets involved. All right, so the uh, Molly system is going to be these these louvers that are down here. I don't know if you can see these or not. What's a Molly system? The Molly, it's, it's, a, it's, it's easier just to show you. <laughs> Molly system is what is designed for the equipment to attach onto. It's a military spec. That's what we're going to show you. See how it's it's, it, it's got louvers. Okay, know, like a belt, strap and like it's strap got the, exactly. yeah, the hook system. So our our vest will have a Molly system going all the way up, just oh, below wow. the um, the badge and uh, breast line here, or just above the breast line. So that enables these guys to move their equipment a little bit farther up on their torso and they can place it more evenly around their, their chest. Yeah. So every it's it's personal preference. Mm -hmm. So it, it's right. based on where the officers are comfortable and where they start learning the training that uh, uh, you know where their equipment's at. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Carason your light is on. Yeah, a couple of questions. First, I, I'm glad you said something about the training. Uh, so now everyone will be trained differently because I would assume that, um, you know, it becomes second nature as you train where your, where your uh, pistol is and where your uh, taser is. And so, I mean, how, how do you... How do you work that training since everybody may have different preferences? Well, you learn through memory retention from carrying your gear. Mm -hmm. You know, all of us, even on these belts here, I can set my belt up however I want. Oh, okay. You know, okay, that makes sense. I'm, I'm required to carry certain equipment, but I can carry it in different form or fashion. You know, right. some of us carry, um, if, I mean, every one of us, you'll see a different deviation, and it's based on our own personal preference. So That makes sense. Does okay. everybody carry a telephone? Everybody's issued a telephone, yes. Okay, and then my second question was, those uh, that have purchased ahead of time, will they be reimbursed? No. I already knew where I was going to, too. <laughs> And then, uh, thank you very much for the team court. I know that you all worked very, very hard uh, to get that completed, and uh, I appreciate it wholeheartedly. No and I truly believe that it is an asset to this community and that um, it's going to help in the long run with our department, with our crime rate, and uh, today is a day that I found out that one of... Uh, one of the juveniles that I took care of through DJJ passed away from an overdose. And so um, it is so important. Thank you.
ready for a motion? Um, I got a couple other lights on, and I have some questions too. Commissioner Emmerich, sorry about your loss to your. Yeah, I can understand the process on having everything mobile in the front because of the weight disbursement. Um, what is the actual weight of all the equipment on there that an officer is going to be carrying around nowadays? <laughs> yeah, there's no. <laughs> About 35 pounds? Dustin, yeah. you know? 35, 40 pounds. Yeah, that's what they on their, on their hips. Oh, actually, absolutely, yes. That's the old school way. Not like the fire department, though, right? <laughs> we weren't going there today. Um, the other question I have is the money that we're putting into this program, does that include every single officer that needs one? Yes. Including the officers that have already purchased one themselves. That is correct. So whoever already has one will now have a spare that because of their own purchase. That is correct. Okay. That's all I had. Thank you very much. And I appreciate Commissioner Armrich because that was one of my questions. How many vests is this buying? And um, how much do those cost? They're about 240 something. Yeah, and then with the Mollies, right around 300. Yeah, a little 300, a little over 300 per officer with all the attachments that go with it. And this 51,000, like Commissioner Armrich's question, just one for every officer? Yes. And what's the ETA for delivery on those once you once this passes? Um, I was going to say six to eight weeks. Okay. Yep. Um, so I uh, was reading the state statute, and it said something about the, um, I think it was 20% of, 25% of forfeiture funds has to go towards education. Um, and that 25% of that 82,000 is nowhere close to that 10. So how, how is the rest going to be dis dispersed for education? Because if you're spending $51,000 for these outer carriers, which absolutely need to be done, um, how do we get to that 25% threshold for these forfeiture funds that we received? Yeah, go ahead. Um, Deputy Chief Morales. Uh, so in the fiscal year, uh, we've already allocated um, money for um, that 25%, and we always, every year, always go over 25%. Um, so that's why we gave the 5000 to make sure we were over the threshold of what we've taken in. But we've given this year in the fiscal year um, 8000 um, goes for like the community shirts that gives back for safe neighborhoods, um, our CPSA that we do every year. And also our citizens, 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 citizens public Academy. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, our CPSA Academy and the um, National Night Out. Okay. So we have we put a lot. We use a lot of forfeitures funds to uh, facilitate those types of programs. And if we ever do take in, um, we bring in more like this uh, this forfeiture um, uh, monies that came available. We, we bring it in and we also, we give back out, we do a budget amendment, but we always go above that threshold. Even if we don't meet the 25%, we still give what we have in our budget to those, those programs because they are, they are, they're great programs to have. And uh, Officer Smith, thank you very much for your public comment because it, it was very moving and it sparked a whole nother conversation that I, I truly don't think would have happened. Thank you to your staff for the education and the visual aids. Thank you, Mr. Kerr, Officer Kerr, for your showing us what that looks like. So, uh, seeing no other speakers, anybody else? I'll entertain a motion. Thank you, guys. I'll move to approve ordinance number 2020-12 as presented. Okay. Ooh, you got a tie. I got a motion on the floor by Vice Mayor to approve um, ordinance number 2020-12 as presented. Um, for second reading, seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. Anything to that? Uh, not to the motion, but to to Scott Smith. Uh, I, I pray complete healing to you soon, sir. Thank you. Commissioner Emmerich. Thank you for your service and your sacrifice. Thank you. And Thank you, Mr. Smith. Thank you. And to your family, too, because while you're going through it, physically, they are watching it too, and they are participating in your healing. So to your whole family, and thank you again, staff. We'll go ahead and take the vote. 
And that passed five to zero. Thank you. Moving on to ordinance number 2019-15, and this is the second slash third reading for fences. City Attorney, do we have to read that by title only again since this is the second time? To be safe. Be safe, thank you very much. City Clerk, if you would please read by title only. Ordinance number 2019-15, an ordinance of the City of Northport, Florida, amending the Unified Land Development Code related to fences by amending Section 53-3, Section 53-240, and Section 61-3, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, providing for codification, and providing an effective date. Thank you. Um, City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this is, as you stated, the third reading of this. Uh, we've made the changes that you requested at both the second and the third reading as a commission, so we're ready for this to be adopted unless you have further questions. Seeing no questions or speaker lights, anybody? Uh, I do have one follow-up question, um, line number 85 of the ordinance. It says, side or rear yard not abutting a street where fence is install installed on a side or rear yard um, that is not abutting the street, the fence may be a maximum of eight feet. So my question is, what happens, because I can't see it in here, where in here does it address if it is like a corner lot? How does that get addressed for side or your rear yards? Um, so for the record, Nicole Gale House Planning Division Manager. Um, this is addressed in um, line 74. The, it starts in line 74, so it's front yard or if it's abutting a street. Um, so that would address any side or rear lots that are on a right of way. Okay, so front yard or abutting a street would also include the side or rears. Yes, if it's it's if it's okay. any any setback or yard that's abutting the street. Just needed that double checking. So thank you very much. Um, seeing no lights on, I'll entertain a motion. We move to approve ordinance number. 2019-15 as presented. Right. Motion on the floor, um, approving our ordinance number 2019-15 as presented by Vice Mayor, seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. Anything to that, Vice Mayor? No, ma'am. Commissioner Emmerich. No, ma'am. Thank you very much. Seeing no speaker lights, we'll go ahead and call the vote. And that passed four to one with um, Commissioner Carasone dissenting. Anything to the reason for dissent, Commissioner Carasone? Yeah, I, I still am, I still don't like it that, you know, there's so many restrictions on the citizens and where they can put a fence up. And I just, I, I don't think it's all about safety and well being. I just don't. And, uh, I don't think that people should have a right to look in my backyard or my front yard, and uh, uh, I'm just not happy with it, so. Thank you, Commissioner. All right, moving on to resolution number 2020-R-05. This is the um, Hazard Mitigation Grant Program for Water Control, water control <laughs> Structure 113. City Clerk. Resolution number 2020-R-05, a resolution of the City of Northport, Florida, authorizing the City Manager or designee to sign and execute the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program application for the rehabilitation of water control structure 113, incorporating recitals, providing for conflicts, providing for severability, and providing an effective date. Thank you, City Clerk. City Attorney, it, did I do something wrong? No, ma'am. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Okay. City, you don't have to talk. okay, city manager, uh, anything that you would like to present on this item? Um, this is just, um, again, one of the opportunities that our, our grant writer has found so that we can ap apply for grants to help offset some city costs. One of our water control structures needs to be repaired. Um, the city is requesting <coughs> over $3.1 million to help make that repair, um, and the matching funds would be just over a million, so basically out of a four plus million dollar project. If we get this grant, we would have to cover a million dollars instead of the full four million dollars to rehabilitate that water control structure. Any speakers? Seeing none, I do have one question. Um, 
do you have an idea when we may hear if we were awarded? Um, I, I'll ask Valerie to come on up and see if she knows a time frame. Typically, we do not, but sometimes, sometimes we do. Uh, for the record, Valerie Malikowski, grant writer. And um, as of right now, the state is still awarding um, tier two and two, tier three applicants from Hurricane Irma. So um, I'm going to estimate it would be a year to two years before we would actually hear something. It just takes the process, it takes a long time. And, and I, I will. <coughs> save my comment about that for afterward, but I do have a follow-up question. Um, water control structure 113, is it going to make it a year or two? What happens if we have to do some repairs, emergency repairs, and we've applied for this grant? Does the grant go away, or could we apply it to, I don't know, water control structure 114? I don't know. Well, we would still or have somewhere. to, we have to use the grant on the water control structure um, that we apply for. Um, if we had emergency repairs, we would need to make those emergency repairs. That wouldn't have anything to do with the complete replacement um, and rehabilitation of the water control structure. Um, another thing we took into consideration is this is a two-phase grant application. Um, resolutions for the entire amount, if we're awarded, it'll be in design and then also in construction. If we wanted to this fall, if we budget for it, and want to design next year, we can contact the state and let them know that we've decided to move forward with the design and we would have a construction ready grant application sitting on their desk, so. Good. Thank you very much. Any other speakers? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion. Move to approve resolution number 2020-R-05 as presented. Second. Got a motion on the floor by Vice Mayor for ordinance number 2020 R-20 as presented, and that was seconded by Commissioner Hanks. Anything to that? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. Commissioner no, Hanks? No, ma'am. Thank you. Um, thank you for applying for the grant, and um, hopefully everybody gets paid for Irma in a timely manner, because those a lot of those cities are still hurting, so thank you. Um, we'll go ahead and call the vote. And that passed five to zero. Seeing that there's no other um, business except for general topics, we have three general topics. It is now quarter to 12. Um, I will put us in recess until 12.30 for break for lunch and then re reconvene at 12.30. We're in recess until 12.30.
smaller, less expensive. <laughs> to go with her. Definitely this year. I agree with that. Okay. All righty, guys. It's twelve thirty-two. We're back in session. All right. So now we are going to move on to general business discussion and possible action regarding the neighborhood revitalization plan. Um, and we are joined by the assistant city attorney, uh, city manager, Mr. Yarborough. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, so I'll go ahead and let you present that item. Thank you. Thank you. Um, at uh, previous uh, uh, council commission discussion, um, y'all with some information brought back. Um, we have several different items we'd like to talk, get, dive into more detail, uh, and we're recommending, staff recommending doing a dedicated meeting on this type of topic. Like one of the things is we want to bring back sign design or input from the commission. So we're recommending that we. Uh, do a dedicated meeting on this topic, or but we're we're ready to give a presentation today and also answer questions today if, if need be. But um, I, it would be our job to do a dedicated meeting on this, so we can do a deeper dive and give some more some more specific input. Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor, uh, Mr. Yarbrough, I'd like to have a you know specific meeting for it, but I do have a question that hopefully you can answer. Uh, through this revitalization, I know Commissioner Emmerich and myself have several times talked about the signs for the neighborhoods. Now, did we not have money in this current year's budget for five? We do. Is there going to be for five more in next year's budget? Um, staff is aware that it is the commission's um, desire for additional signage, in, but uh, I don't, I don't want to speak for the department head on that, but I suspect she's well, budgeting be, it. Because this, you know, we might have a meeting at another point in time. Mm -hmm. This is at the time where budget is right. being worked on, Now's being the time talked to about. Exactly. So I didn't want to dismiss a short discussion if that is something, you know, that we need to make sure you have in the budget for next year. Thank you. By all means. Oh, Ms. Belia. Yes, ma'am. Uh, for the record, Julian Abalia, Public Works Director. Uh, yes, ma'am, we do have uh, $50,000 in this current fiscal year budget. We are looking at um, some different options for signage. For example, if you have uh, existing community signs for a large neighborhood such as Highland Ridge and Country Club Ridge, we would like to, uh, we would be proposed that that sign would be replaced <clears throat> to the same type signage, the monument sign. However, for smaller subdivisions, or maybe it's just a couple of streets, We've uh, done some research in, in other uh, cities, and they have, for example, the name of the subdivision on top of a street sign, just to make it a little bit more affordable and save money. Um, but that's just some of the things we're looking at, um, rather than it be $5,000 per sign, uh, roughly, and um, that way we could get, because we have 75 neighborhoods, we'd have to put signage in. So just kind of um, making the size of the sign consistent with the size of the neighborhood, if you will. And of course, that would be if we did that on the, just the two street subdivision, for example, it would be on all the street signs, the name of the subdivision. So that's just some of the options we'd like to bring back to you and make the best use of the money. But okay. yes, ma'am, for the future I mean, budgets, it would be budgeting money every year to we make sure all the 75 neighborhoods have signage. That's what I wanted to know. Yes, if there was going to be money allocated in this budget so that we could continue, continue. that program. Yes, ma'am. That's all I needed to know, because if you want to discuss in detail at another mm -hmm. point, I'm fine. I just wanted to make sure yes, we were headed in that direction. Thank yes. you. Yes, ma'am. Commissioner Don't Emerson. go, Julie. Commissioner <laughs> While she was up here, I figured I'd ask a question. Now, the one question I was going to ask you, for the money that's budgeted for the signage for this year, when you bring back your presentation, mm -hmm. you are looking at installing and completing that signage this year, correct? Yes, yes, sir. Installing and completing. Yes, sir. This fiscal make, year. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that was on the record. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. That's all I had. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So, here's my question, Assistant City Manager. Yes, ma'am. Um, this, this neighborhood revitalization is far more than just replacing signs in a neighborhood. Yes. And we have been wanting to have this discussion for over two years now. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be frank, I'm kind of tired of kicking the can down the road. And I understand that staff is still working on it, 
but it's been two years. And I know we had a meeting last year about this same time about neighborhood revitalization. And speaking for myself, I don't want to wait anymore. I don't want to wait another year before we finally come up with some solutions on how we are going to revitalize these neighborhoods, keep them from going into blight. Because the longer we procrastinate, the more the blight is going to flourish. And I appreciate my fellow commissioners and the signs. I'm over the signs. Let's move on to the bigger meat and potatoes part of this whole discussion. Um, and that's just my thought on it. Do you have an idea when you would like to have this single meeting? I will, uh, I think we'd have to coordinate, but um, I'd love to get some input from our NDS staff. And I also have to wonder, does it affect the grant? Are there time constraints with this grant that we... No, I think we've generated the product with the grant. But. Yeah, okay. the grant, is, for the record, Nicole Diaz, planning division manager, the grant is completely closed out. Okay, um, thank So you. we're now just trying to work on follow-up and implementation of the study that came out of that. Um, I think the reason for trying to m move this to a workshop is because some of these items, um, to really go through this and get commission direction on all of them, is going to be more <coughs> time-intensive than... Um, you know, a regular meeting would really allow. So when do you think we could do a meeting? When would you like, or when do you think we could prep for a meeting? Um, within the next month or so, or whatever date the commission. Obviously, we, we need to coordinate with the city clerk's office uh, on y'all's schedules, but, I mean, we're talking about relatively soon because staff would like to get some direction so we can plan the budget accordingly. So that would, that would be, uh, you know, that, for the record, Frank Miles, our Director of Neighborhood Development Services, that, as the assistant city manager pointed out, that would be the main purpose in, in order to have this more informed discussion so we can have direct input uh, to each of the divisions within NDS and as well as the other departments that will require some budgetary implications um, uh, for new programs, new ideas, if there's any infrastructure, et cetera. So, Thank you. I would say sooner rather than later. Yeah, well, my sooner is far different than everybody else's in City Hall. <laughs> well, I don't think there was, you know, a huge urgency to the entire plan. We wanted to see the plan, and on page two, you have a pretty good timeline and, and plan and the description of, you know, what each of them were. So I think to go into this will take a little more time to go into each of them. But there's none of them as urgent and, and pressing as there was this hanging out of the signs. Now, Mayor might be sick of hearing, you know, about that. But if you're in one of those neighborhoods, you're wondering where that sign is at. So I just wanted to make sure that that was going to be continued uh, before we even have this deeper discussion. Because on this timeline, that's the only thing that's pressing is the signs. Uh, Commissioner Emmerich. Yeah, the one question that I had, and it's not pertain, uh, staff could answer, but it's basically for you, Mayor. Um, you had mentioned a workshop. Wouldn't it be who of us to have it on a special meeting or a regular meeting so we can give direction rather than just consensuses? That's what staff was recommending, a dedicated meeting, not necessarily a workshop. I, right. So y'all can take action. Nicole. That's okay. okay. All right, that's all settled. I got it. Thank you. Uh, City Clerk. I was just going to say that it is on the rolling agenda for April 6th, but that is a workshop. Sounds good to me. So does... But you can give us consensus, and then we can address it again during the budget process. So maybe what we could do is get consensus to have this larger deep dive discussion um, between now and the first Monday in May. Whether it be a special meeting or a workshop, we'll leave that to you guys to okay. figure out. Um, do I have a consensus for that? I'm good with that. Yeah, I, yeah, I personally would rather have, have it during a meeting so we can actually take action. Right. Well, that's so, what they were talking about, have a special meeting, not a workshop. Oh, well, I heard I, the mayor I said, said more a workshop. So. Leaving it to their discretion. But they already stated they wanted a special, special meeting. meeting. Correct. Right. We want you to be able to make some decisions. Right. Then I would say yes to a special meeting, possibly. Okay. Or during our special meeting times, okay. The free scheduled times we have, okay. Yeah. Yes. Special meeting, yes. Okay. So add an extra meeting. So 
So let's get that get coordinated as soon as possible and get on everybody's calendars. Okay. Um, so we will just take no action on this and pending future discussion. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank All you. right, um, moving on to Scrub J Management. Stick around. <laughs> I'm going to just run to my office and get my notes for this. Okay. I left them in there. I'll be right back. Go okay. ahead. We'll okay. City Manager, do you want to go ahead and introduce 7B for us, please? Yes, ma'am. Uh, this is uh, uh, the Heron Creek uh, development of regional impact. Um, one of the components of that is a, a scrub jay habitat that was to be uh, maintained uh, as part of the development order. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to neighborhood development staff to explain and, and walk you through the issue. Um, uh, for the record, Nicole Galehouse, Planning Division Manager with Neighborhood Development Services. Um, so the Heron Creek DRI was established in 1998, or 1996, sorry. Um, and there is an area within it that was supposed to be managed as a hub, uh, Florida Scrub Jay Habitat Management. Um, there is a plan that was adopted along with the um, development order. Um, and so the um, commission asked us to look into what is being done on this, what has been done on this on this site in terms of the scrub jay management. Um, we were not able to find a lot of information in our records about it. Um, the most recent thing we have is um, in 2017, we got a letter from Ian Vincent and Associates um, basically saying that the habitat is overgrown and it no longer lends itself to being um, suitable scrub jay habitat. Um, they recommended that the requirement be removed from the development order, but currently it does still stand on the development order. So, um, you know, I'm here for questions, direction. Um. Okay. There they are. Commissioner Emrich. Now you just stated removed from the development order. Does that mean we just leave it as it is and do nothing about it? The, as far as the actual area? Yeah. That was what the consultant recommended. I don't, I'm not a biologist. I know we've heard from a few biologists in public comment about, you know, whether or not that can be restored to a habitat in which the scrub jays would return. Um, so I, I think we need more information on that perspective. But the recommendation from them was to remove it so they don't have to do anything else. But it's right. really they, up to this board whether so, you sorry. want to, um, you know, require them to follow through on what they originally promised or basically relieve them of the requirement. Right. So basically, they were required to maintain it. Now that they haven't, it's been suggested that we do nothing about it. Not by staff. Not by staff. No, no, no. By the well, consultant. <laughs> clarify. Um, by the environmental consultant, yes. Thank you. Commissioner Hanks? Um, <clears throat> yeah, the one that did the study in the letter, they have a vested interest in this, do they not? Or do they? I mean, I'm reading this here, controlling interest of the Heron Creek DRI. National Land Group, the study and letter were completed on behalf? Yes, the, the consultant <clears throat> was hired by the um, so, representatives of the property owner. So therefore, they have, they have a vested interest in whether they do or don't that. do it either way. Okay, that's all, that's all I have. Seeing no other speaker <clears throat> comment, um, I will. Can you comment or just questions? I, this, is, this is really um, general discussion, so I think it could be questions or comments. Um, okay. It's a little bit different than the legal proceedings that we have to follow. Yes, I'm sorry, Vice Mayor. Uh, the, the scrub jay was there initially when this DRI and everything was put in. Uh, they did not maintain it. Maintain, maintenance isn't that difficult if you do it uh, regularly like it's supposed to be done. So they're not finding any right now. That's because it wasn't maintained. So they left. And as the speaker who is the expert on this has even talked about a couple of times to us, they don't go very far. So they are found about a mile, mile and a half from that area currently. And as the expert has already addressed also, the the young, the, the little siblings, after a certain amount of years, they go find their own home and habitat. So that mile, mile and a half is a great 
distance. I mean, it's perfect for them to be able to relocate back here where they pretty much basically came from to start with. So uh, I think it behooves us to make sure that this is put back into the shape that it was supposed to have been maintained in all along and allow the area for the scrub jay to be brought back so it can come back also. That's my comment. Okay. Um, I'm curious, the outline steps that you have here with scrub restoration, scrub maintenance, and maintenance schedule, I would assume that the developer of the DRI would have to pay for that, correct? Yes. Do you have an estimated cost? Uh, just a best guess kind of, I, I couldn't even begin. That's not in our wheelhouse. No. Okay. Um, I, I understand that when, when was this DRI originally approved? Uh, 98. 98, I believe. Maybe I, I think it was 99. Okay, so, so we're looking... 98, 99, we'll, we'll call it 20 years. It's been 20 years. <coughs> the developer, for obvious reasons, neglected it. Staff constantly is changing. Commission is constantly changing. The commission that approved the DRI constantly changes. And I, I would figure that there was some kind of condition put on that DRI that this be done. Staff changes, and it fell through the cracks. Purposely, not on purposely, eh, tomato, tomato. But the point is it was there. The point is that it should have been done. And I, I, I have a hard time understanding and agreeing to just not do anything like what was recommended because where's the accountability? And then I have to go, hmm, how many other DRIs or how many other developments have similar conditions that fell through these proverbial cracks? So um, I, I am all for making or upholding the original agreement and having them do what they're supposed to do. And I don't know if you can put a timeline on it. And I don't know how they can do their regular maintenance that they're required to do, their reports. that They were supposed to do reports. Um, and that didn't happen. So I have a very, very hard time and would never approve just, okay, say lovey. That's not going to happen with my vote. So um, those were my comments. Commissioner Emmerich, your light is on. Yeah, if it was there and it was agreed upon, how do we hold their feet to the fire to make sure this gets done? What are our, what's our legal standings? What do we do? The development order has enforcement mechanisms in it. Um, it requires a um, legal notice, or not legal notice, but a notice um, to the applicant of a public hearing to be held um, where they are able to come present their side of the story. Um, and I believe um, the, essentially if they don't comply with the requirements, we have the ability to hold up any development order within their review of development of regional impact. It, it pauses their development order. But that has to be done in a public hearing. Well, it's time to get those notices out because I believe it's coming. Thank you. Commissioner Carousel. Do we have an aerial? Do we have an aerial view of the area that we're discussing? <coughs> I can pull one up. That would be great. Yeah, I wanted an aerial view. The um, You're so quick. Look at you go. She is quick. I'm telling you, she's awesome. Impressive. How many times a day do you do this? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> a lot, right? Okay. Um, so we're looking at, um, and the, the maps that kind of circle, the there's two areas. 
Mm -hmm. or three areas actually. There's two south of Price and one north of Price, but they're mm -hmm. pretty mm -hmm. much along the border of the development um, going towards the Mayaka Hatchie Creek. Okay. And so as I understand it, Sarasota County actually has a, um, a plan, a, um, I started taking notes here, a management plan, a way to regenerate uh, this, this area for scrub jay habitat. And um, I made some phone calls throughout the week. Uh, one of the things is that this, this, while it may not see a scrub jay family for 10, 20 years, it can also provide an area, a natural system where they can sit and, and take comfort before they move on to their next area of flight, wherever it may be. It's a little resting area for them. Um, but the bigger deal is that this particular area leads to many of our um, our natural habitat. You know, the deer, the the um, the bobcat, so on and so forth. And as you take away these lands, it drives those back into uh, the residential area. And so, with all that in mind, and especially as as adjacent this is to the corridor that we're trying to preserve, my concern is, you know, how, first of all, how do we, I'm not sure, I didn't really read the uh, DRI as, as closely as I'm sure my compadres here did, but um, do we utilize that, uh, that Sarasota County's management plan uh, do we refer to it in our DRI or the or the requirements? Yeah. There's a specific scrub jay management plan that was designed for this property. For this property, yeah. okay. And um, does it does it is it outlined in our attachments by chance? Um, yes, I believe it's the first attachment. The um, DRI plan is a first attachment. The updated memo. It's the Heron Creek DRI Scrub J Management Plan. So okay, and this requires, uh, I'm sure it requires mitigation by fire. Page yes. four. Yeah. Right, okay. And I believe that there's ways to, um, to do this um, fire mitigation even in residential areas. Uh, for instance, in South Venice at the Lemon Bay Park, they did it, and it's only <coughs> two streets away from my, my mother's house. So um, is that, I love how they spelled Northport wrong with, <laughs> with Northport being one word. That just kind of irks me, by the way. Um, this if management I'm plan, is it, I mean, since it was put together in 2000, is it really... It may need to be reviewed. It was done by John Saxton, who's pretty um, well known in terms of yes. the scrub jays. Um, it, does it does talk about the, the scrub jay restoration, habitat restoration within it, um, and it calls for burns, but then it also says if burning is deemed to be inappropriate, the unit would need to be handled uh, or treated mechanically. So there's different options within there in terms of restoration of habitat. Okay, okay, because I'm not sure as I understood it, that burning is truly the only way to restore it versus any of the other restoration possibilities. But um, if John put this together, then I would assume that, you know, it would still apply. Uh, okay, um, all right. Oh, one more thing. Did they um, allude to what it is that why is it that they asked that this be removed by chance? So that's in the letter from Ian Vincent and Associates that's um, attached to your backup material. Um, they were asked to do um, research regarding the preserve area at the time. Um, and so they kind of outline the work that they did. Um, and um, basically they say that this, the habitat doesn't exist there presently. Um, yeah, I'm pulling it. It basically up. says it's been overgrown and ha transitioning into a habitat that would not be suitable for the species. Okay, but again, their DRI says that they're supposed mm -hmm. to manage it and 
and ok all right i just wanted to make sure that there was nothing that they had on the books of you know a expansion of residential properties or expansion of golf course or something to that degree that had prompted this not to our knowledge ok thank you commissioner hanks um yeah i would assume if we'd have been keeping up with what we we're supposed to be doing we probably wouldn't have um, an area that was inhabited i also know that we are consistently looking for places to mitigate our scrub jays as we develop and grow and build so i don't i i see absolutely no reason why we can't do the things that we agreed we would do with this area allow a place if if they don't exist now, we're looking for a place to help mitigate these scrub jays as we, you know, as we develop out property. So, I, I think it's a, uh, <clears throat> I think we should do what, what we had agreed to all along. Vice Mayor, I saw nowhere, <coughs> nowhere in that DRI that it puts in that a stipulation if no scrub jays are found then it's over and done and canceled. I saw nothing in there regarding to that. So in my opinion, for them to bring that letter and try to get out of not doing what they're supposed to be doing by stating that, they're wrong. It, it does that, that was not even in that DRI. So in my opinion, they need to bring it back to the condition that it's supposed to be in. Thank you. Um. We are proposing, and maybe Parks and Rec is going to have to help with this. Um, there's a proposal to put a trail along the eastern side of the Myakahatchee Creek from Appomattox to Price. How will this scrub jay mitigation area land affect that trail? Because I, I don't see one on top of the other. Yeah. So. yeah, I think we'd have to overlay that and just make sure. I would. My gut says that the scrub jay habitat area is on their property, and the trail is going on our property. Okay. So and, I, and that's what believe. I believe is the case, but I'd have to look into it a little bit further. Okay, so... They, maybe, shouldn't, they shouldn't overlap each other. Okay, so, so the trail is not going to have, um, hinder the management of the scrub jay area. I just wanted that to be confirmed. Um, so, thank you. I don't see any other con. One more question, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Do we have anything in place now at this point to uh, make sure that we're monitoring this DRI and any others that have this type of I'm working on it. This, um, when this was first brought to my attention, um, you know, I realized some of the things, like you said, that we were missing. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been working diligently with my staff to identify what all those are. We're finally at a point with this one where we have it all laid out. Mm -hmm. um, and so we'll be doing one DRI at a time and mm -hmm. going through all of our old development orders um, and working on mechanisms by which to track those conditions. Um, and you're prioritizing by looking at areas versus just looking at them in a list. You know, I would think that any any DRI that takes place in adjacent to an environmentally sensitive area would be right. priority versus just right. this one, this one, this one. So this we one. have we only have three DRIs in the city. So we have Heron Creek. There you go. Um, then we have Panacea, which also has some environmental areas. So that's mm -hmm. next on the list. And then mm -hmm. we have the Gardens, which has zero activity going on right now. So um, that's third on the list. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. That was it. I have one question. Wouldn't um, a sustainability manager and a natural resource department aid in watching over DRIs? That really wouldn't really would be her call. Okay, I see Frank coming. That really wouldn't be for, for her to answer that. Okay. I, I, can say the DRI man or conditions are not limited to just environmental conditions. There's a wide spectrum of conditions that to are accesses. Well, okay. But we look forward to having this conversation during the budget. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. I was just wondering if that wouldn't aid them in all of their duties. And well, it, it, any additional resources above and beyond will always be appreciated. But as you know, that comes with a price. Yes. 
Boy, I hate Mr. Nice Guy. Any other comments? Well, I love him. Assistant City Manager, Miles. Assistant City Manager. did Mr. Miles want to lay in, weigh in on? Uh, again, for the record, uh, Frank Miles, Director of Neighborhood Development Services. I would just want to point out that uh, scrub jays are federally managed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We have reached out to their regional folks. They have been out of the office, uh, but we fully intend on having them weigh in on this as well. We've been in conversations with them constantly, just like we did with the gopher tortoises. Uh, they <coughs> have some role and responsibility in this as well. Absolutely. Cool. Thank you. All righty, so uh, before we take action, uh, Mr. Ms. Catherine Prophet, and next up is Mr. William English. Thank you. You've made my job really easy because you've already covered half what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Where I really want to pick up is that the opportunity to provide suitable habitat for these birds has not expired. The value of the property hasn't diminished due to its being neglected. You can cut down those trees, you can burn, you can do mechanical, whatever you have to do because of the surrounding neighborhoods. In two to three years, it'll be suitable habitat again. Then it's just a matter of waiting for the birds to move back in. Somebody had mentioned that it can be used as what we call a stepping stone. There are birds all around that particular area, so they'll be moving through it to get to each other. And that's ultimately how you end up with more birds there usually, because they hear each other, they've been through, and somebody goes, hey, this is kind of a nice spot. I think I'll just stay right here. <laughs> so, skipping right to the bottom of my whole list, in my opinion, it would be unconscionable to let this landowner get away with not following through with their agreement. If we let them get away with it, you're going to have people knocking down your doors trying to do the same thing. So I ask that you please not do that. If you have any questions, I'd be more than glad to answer them. If not, like I said, you guys covered most of what I was going to say. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Prophet. Thank you. Again, appreciate you being here. Mr. English. William English, Northport. Uh, first off, I'd like to commend staff for the work they've done on this issue. The other aspect of it is that my concern is how many other DRIs are out there, and you've covered that. The only concern I have is how we got to this point. Where was the breakdown? Okay. I believe the breakdown no longer exists within the city. Uh, also, this is a very good reason why we need some form of natural resource overview. When we do have the expertise within the city, we just need to consolidate them into a group and do something similar to the development review process in the short term until such time as we can establish some type of NR process. I'm sure this is going to be at least two budget cycles before it even gets to anywhere meaningful. But again, I commend the new staff. They've done an excellent job. And I thank the commission for addressing this issue and taking it seriously. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. English. Um, Ms. Patrice, uh, did you want to speak now for this agenda item? Because your card also says public comment at the end. Okay, come on up. And just state your name for the record, please. Hi, I'm Patrice Matz. And um, I, I support the reestablishment of the scrub jay and uh, the habitat at the Heron Creek. I just wanted to say that. And from my own experience, um, by planting a butterfly garden in my yard, if you plant native, they will come. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Patrice. All right, seeing no other public comment cards, let's give staff some directions. I'll make a motion to uh, direct staff to fulfill the DRI. Motion on the floor to 
uh, direct staff to take the steps necessary to fulfill the DRI that is in effect. And that was made by Vice Mayor, seconded by Commissioner Carousel. Vice Mayor? I really don't have anything that hasn't already been stated, so thank you. Commissioner Carousel. Nothing. Wow. Let's take the vote. Seeing no other comments. Yours, yours is in delayed action, isn't it? It won't even take your fingerprint. And that passed five to zero. Doesn't say yes here. Fantastic. Great news. Um, looking forward to seeing that. All right. So now we are going to move on to discussion and possible action regarding the challenge coins. Um, I guess city manager? Yes, ma'am. Um, at the December uh, 5th, City Commission special meeting. Uh, the commission uh, discussed potential designs of challenge coins. Two designs were selected. Uh, staff was directed to obtain pricing. We were obtained pricing from three different vendors and different uh, purchase amounts. Uh, you've got vendor A, which can provide pricing at 3.44 uh, a piece. This doesn't include shipping. Uh, anyway, the, the whole chart of, of pricing is there. Uh, and we just need some direction if y'all would like to move forward with this item. Commissioner Emmerich. I was in the design phase. I was just looking at the designs, and I just wanted to comment on those, if, if I can do that. Your time, sir. I like the, well, I'm calling the, where it says the seal. I'm calling that the front, the other the back. I'm in favor of the second rendition for the front where it says the seal of the city of Northport. But I like the back on the top one. Two top ones. Well, the back would be you made a difference or in honor of your greatness. I thought we already had this discussion, though. These are the designs that we're approving now. That's We, we cut it down to two, and these are the two that they're bringing back for designs. And you said you liked what one? I, if you look at the front of the second one, there's a little bit yeah, more detail. Yeah, there's two on the top, and then there's two on the bottom. So you're talking about the group? Okay. The bottom two. Okay. The, bottom two. Okay. the black background. Okay. Okay, if you look at the front of it, the trees look healthier. So does the fish and the bird. <laughs> look at the top one. The trees look puny. The fish is two-toned, and I can't even hardly see the bird. They look Even the same on mine. Everything's they, healthy. They don't to me. They look way different. On mine. One looks like a dolphin. Right. This bottom one looks more like a dolphin. The top one sort of looks like a two-tone tarpon. But I liked the way that it was presented in the second one with the black background. I did not care for seeing just the plain logo there. I like how it was broken down on the top where it says you made a difference and then the logo was inserted in the center. I like in honor of your greatness for the verbiage. Commissioner, is that all you had? Did you see what I'm, do you understand what I'm talking about? Okay. Yeah. Commissioner Carousel. First of all, I thought that we had already gave direction for the design. So, so the quite and that we were going to have, I think, two different designs. Isn't that what we had already decided? Correct. So, do these designs represent different vendors? Is the question. They do. It's, it's three different vendors, and uh, so each of the groupings is a different vendor. Oh, and by the way, it appears that. Two of the vendors didn't exactly get our seal right. Our, our seal says seal of the city of Northport. It doesn't say seal of Northport. So just FYI, yeah. it's not exactly, it's an interpretation of our seal. It does, it's not, doesn't match up, the wording right. doesn't match up with our seal. Right, and I agree with Commissioner uh, Emmerich. One looks like a dolphin. Uh, so 
I guess that which vendor goes with which pitchers. Well, Commissioner Carazone's actually right on this. We did eliminate it down to the two coins. Yeah. So all we're doing now is selecting the pricing vendor. and the vendor because each of them are two coins. You're deciding whether you want 250 or you want 500 and at what unit price. That's all we have to right. decide. So if we're looking at these designs, then I think it's important to know which vendors are giving us the dolphin versus the fish. <laughs> That's but where I'm going. You'll also have that backing though. We already said that though. We've already had that conversation. Just for the record, the seal, I pulled up the actual seal of the city of Northport, and it is not a dolphin. It is more of a fish. Yeah, it's so, right behind us, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a bass? No. What is that, a turpin? I have no idea. Yeah, it's a fish? It's a turpin, right? It's a I, I, believe it, I believe it was supposed to be a turpin. It's, it's not a dolphin, dolphin, and it's not a shark. Okay, <laughs> call it a snook. fish. That snooky look. If I may, I commission. Anna Duffy, City Manager's Office. Um, the commission, you're absolutely correct. The commission direction was to bring back pricing. You had already selected the design. Mm -hmm. um, what I did is I, I contacted some vendors to just obtain pricing, um, being that two of the vendors sent me very quick draft proofs. Mm -hmm. These are not final in any way, shape, or form. It was just they wanted to show me what they could do with our seal and what we were looking for. They sent those back with, with the pricing options. Um, the, the pricing um, that I sought was the shiny um, gold metallic, very consistent with the same um, look and feel that PD and Fire also use for their challenge coins as well same size as commission had directed. Um, and being that they had provided very rough draft artwork very quickly, city manager had asked me to go ahead and include that with the agenda item so that way you could see those options. Okay, because I'm gonna tell you right now, the first two with the black on the gold is would be my option hands down with the gold around the edging and then the, the two sayings on each. I, Absolutely. And the best part about that is knowing a little bit about, uh, you know, imprints is that it won't take much. So it wouldn't be as um, financially uh, cumbersome. And each of the vendors did take into account that it would be the same um, front, the same city seal stamp on both designs. Right. So they did discount their some of them have called it an, an imprint fee, some of them called it a die fee, Excellent. whatever that setup fee was, each of them took that into consideration. Wonderful. Okay, so really the question is, do we get the two coins at 250? I, I'm not sure what I'm looking at for these vendors A, B, and C. It's what? the exact same pricing for the exact same quantities. I broke it down by vendor for you. Um, at that particular commission meeting, uh, quantity per commissioner was not really discussed. So not knowing what the desire was or the intent, we just went with um, the assumption that the commission would either want 50 or 100 of each coin per commissioner. If that's not the case, we can totally uh, revamp that and revise it. Um, but your quantities are based on 500 of each coin or 250. Okay, well, 500 coins, 100 each, and whatever the least expensive is with that design. How simple is that? <laughs> I mean, there's my motion. Can I get a second? <laughs> Would that make sense? I didn't know you had a motion. Yeah, I didn't know hold that up, was a motion. Hold up, hold up, hold up. I didn't know you were making a motion. You were asking a question. She, and well, then you said. Because I didn't see any more lights, but, but you, now I have a light. You seat. didn't say you were making a motion. You just said, okay. I understand that. So My I, point is, is that it just can be that simple. Gotcha. Uh, 500 coins, 100 for each commissioner, uh, 
that uh, the design being the one with the black and the gold, that's, that's uh, depicted in the first top two, and uh, whichever one is the best price. Bottom line, as long as it comes out, you know. Are you saying 100 per commissioner Correct. per coin? So it's a total of 200 coins? No, it's Because there's two versions 50. of the coins. That's why I'm, I'm asking for clarification. There are two different coins, and you said 100 per commissioner. Is that 100 for each coin, making it 200 coins per commissioner? <sighs> because each coin is a separate coin, because each coin is no. a different die. No. I, I, have a, I would do 50 too. and 50. That seems like a lot. Could I ask staff the unit price? The unit price that you have listed here, does mm -hmm. that take into account the add-ons, the charge, the discount? Is it all figured in? Yes. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. I don't the think only, it includes shipping. The only one, the some top do, one. Some don't. The top one did not include shipping, so that shipping price wasn't factored in. I don't know what that shipping will be. They'd have to give me that estimate once an order is placed. But the other two had free shipping, so that is that was factored into the price of the, the unit price of each coin. But the other two also have a setup charge and no discount, whereas vendor A has no setup charge and a discount. Yeah, but Correct. it's figured into the unit price, though. Mm -hmm. Correct. Uh, there's $25 difference on the 250 amount from vendor one and vendor two uh, that would be utilized in shipping. If those mm -hmm. coins are heavy, you're probably going to have more than $25 worth in shipping. So it makes vendor two's unit price probably the best deal if you're going with those types of quantities. Mr. Emmerich? Vendor B, you mean? Um, yeah, vendor B. Uh, one second. So we're basically looking at... Um, quantities and stuff. Now, will we have a final rendering of what the proof will actually look like when it comes back, or are we making that decision today with the design and everything? That's up to commission direction. Yeah, I think the intent was to pull the trigger and let's get the corns ordered and, and delivered, but um, but obviously it's y'all's final call. Do you know other speaker First, lights? Go ahead, Commissioner. Uh, Personally, Senator. I think I don't know of any vendor that doesn't send a proof back. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. staff knows very well what our um, seal looks like. I think they can look at that proof to make sure that it's all right. Again, I reiterate, all we're looking at is vendor A, B, and C, figuring out what the price is. We've already looked at the design, so we just need to know how many and how much you're wanting to pay per vendor. Commissioner Emmerich? Yeah, this goes back to Commissioner Luke, but if we're looking at, we're looking at three different vendors, correct? And there's two different designs, basically. Do you see what I'm seeing? Because the one that's sitting on the black background, you have the front, which is basically all the same around there, but the back is different. And then the two vendors up top, the back is basically the same. It's just worded differently. Okay, staff, can you clarify on the pictures of the design? What's the difference? They, like I said, these were very rough drafts that the vendor just shot back to me with pricing. There was no discussion on tweaking design or finalizing design because at that point we were more focused on getting the pricing and getting that back to you guys. Um, any changes that need to be made to make sure that that seal is in fact correct and accurate reflecting the city seal, we can work with them to make that happen. Um, it looks like the, the vendor on the top um, just neglected the word city um, from the 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 language or the text around the image, and it looks like the one on the bottom uh, tried to do their own in-house redesign of the, or okay. their 
my, my to question, type, tried to create it on their own. My question is, though, those boxes holding the coins mm -hmm. in are not a particular vendor? There then? were two different two two different vendors. One vendor shot me back the top one. Another vendor shot me back the so, bottom one. And the third one did not send you Did anything. not send me back artwork because I was only asking for pricing at that point. Okay. So it sounds like we have to decide. It, it's been decided the seal is the front. Seal is the now front. Now we have two different backs. Mm -hmm. One is a completely gold back that has in honor of your greatness line by line mm -hmm. or a black and gold black back that has this city of Northport in the center and the phrase you made a difference or in honor of your greatness in a circular around the edge of the coin. We need to decide here and now if we are going to decide here and now which one of those backs we want to right. use. Thank you. So let's Thank you. That's what I was looking at. That back is orange. It's not gold. I just want to be because we do have other coins that look like that. So it it was a very quick digital rendering and it doesn't really I, I personally don't think it captures the metallic look, but when we go to do the order, um, I specified that I was pricing out gold. Do you know which vendor is the top and which vendor is the bottom? Um, I would have to go back to my notes, um, and unfortunately I don't have those here with me, but if we want that back reflected, I can take that back to any of the vendors. Oh, they all the vendors will produce. They should be, yeah. They'll be able to do that. Either one of the backs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ready, Commissioner Carousel. For a motion. Uh, move to move to uh, allow staff to plan for each commissioner to be allocated fifty of each type of designed coin using the top two designs and using the vendor they so choose who gives the best pricing. Second. And the reason why I say that is because we don't really have all the true pricing. Uh, it's hard to determine whether vendor A is really going to come in less than the other unless we have a shipping price. Uh, you know, it may be that vendor B decides that it's heavier with 500 coins versus, you know, 100 coins. We just, this is all very, very draftish. So uh, given that each commissioner would be allocated 50 of each design, that the design is set as the top two, uh, allowing staff to determine the vendor that gives us the best bang for our buck, I think that's fair and reasonable. Motion on the floor as stated by Commissioner Carousel and City Clerk. Did you get that captured? Yes. Thank you very much. Do I hear a second? I okay, second. A second. Oh, I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't hear your second. I apologize, Commissioner no, okay. Emmerich. Com and that was seconded by Commissioner Emmerich. Anything to that, Vice Mayor? I mean, uh, Commissioner Carousel. I already did that. Commissioner Emmerich? The only thing, yeah, I, I agree completely. I would just like to see a rendition of the final proof when it's ready. Anybody else wish to speak to this? Seeing none, I'm going to voice my absolute dismay. And I know it's not going to be popular, but that's okay. We had an opportunity to discuss proclamations, recognitions, and key to the city, and there was no discussion, and it was pushed back for two months. Here we get challenge coins that are to be passed out by each commissioner at their choosing when I've said it over and over again, each commissioner is not an individual, we act as a body. We are one commission, we make decisions as a body, not as individuals. I could never, ever approve challenge coins at these costs. It's not budgeted, it's, it's not necessary. We give recognitions all the time. We give proclamations all the time. The, the most highest accolade you could give is the key to the city. We didn't even have that conversation. And now here we are, 
spending taxpayers' money on a challenge coin that truly is not any meaning behind it because it is not decided on by this commission body. I will never, ever approve challenge coins. Commissioner Carrison. I just want to clarify, we had an extensive conversation about the key to the city, and that's exactly why we're here where we are. Um, you know, if I remember correctly, it was a decision by the AGO that the commission can act as individuals, especially when it comes to writing letters of recommendation. So to say that the only way that we work is as a body uh, is, is just not true. Uh, the, the challenge coins were merely a way to uh, try and find some sort of peace between those who had problems in the past with people giving things away uh, as a representative of the city uh, and have there be some sort of accountability for those things given away. This was not something that the commission took upon itself to say this is important. This was merely a response to someone's complaint about what was done in the past. So let's not, not kid ourselves. The, the whole key to the city conversation has been discussed over and over again. Some of it's been discussed on social media. So uh, let's not say that it was never discussed don't have a policy in place. We didn't have the discussion about the policy. There was a discussion about the policy. We can't we we knew. can't do anything until uh, unless it's brought before us. That was that we did a couple weeks ago and it was extended for two more months to have the discussion on the policy regarding proclamations, recognitions and key to the city. Uh, we yes. have a uh, draft ordinance or an ordinance that we had a first reading, didn't we? No, it got extended for two months. Right. We never had first reading. Well, apparently it's, it's prevented us from doing anything in the past, considering it would have been nice to give that key to the city to the governor while he was here. Commissioner Luke, or Vice Mayor Luke, I apologize. Uh, I, I am somebody who who strives very hard to be a compromiser and a peacemaker. And so I just want to share my thoughts. I, I do believe maybe we need some kind of protocol or procedure within that resolution or ordinance that we're doing because I believe the money to pay for these coins needs to come out of the commission expense. I don't think there should be another um, line item. I mean, we have a certain amount of monies that is used on the commission, and I think this needs to be paid for out of that, not general, but out of the commission. As used? Yeah, yeah. So it, well, I, so I think it's like our out, shirt. So like you our, check one out, and then that would be... Yeah, some doctor. kind of policy like that, like our shirts. You know, we get a certain amount of shirts every so often or that. Oh, my there needs to be, you know, some kind of policy for distribution of the coin, too. So how you handle them, how you distribute them, how they would be reordered, how often they would be... Um, those types of things need to be, when we get to the end of our term, the coins would be handed back into the clerk's office so that then they would be used for the next coming commission. So those types of procedures I would like to see <coughs> place within that thing that's coming back two months from now or whatever, so that it's got the little procedure to it as to how we handle these. Yes, Mayor, why would we not just get them from the clerk's department. I mean, like if I need one, I'd go to the clerk's department and get, get one, and then it would be deducted off of my... You can do that however you guys... I think that would be guys, better than... However you guys, but yeah, then run around with 25 <laughs> of them in your pocket and <laughs> handing them out. Sorry, but I thought hold we on, had already on, had on, this discussion where it would be allocated between each commissioner to do as they wish, Absolutely. and that the, the resolutions and the key to the city were those things that... This was just the item that people can give out without having to go before the board or having to have, you know, it was, it was a token of appreciation, essentially. There was no policy necessary as to how, yes, you get 100 to give out, 50 of one, 50 of the other, and 
I agree at the end of the year it needs to be returned back or at the end of your term, whatever. Um, it's you only on an, an annual basis. Right, you so, have to have an accountability. I personally don't want to hang on to all of them. I'd rather go to the clerk and then say I want two of these. But I agree with Commissioner Karras on that's how it needs to be. I also agree with Vice Mayor Luke that I don't mind if when I check out two of those keys to give away, they deduct that off of my my uh, travel expense or, you know, you know whatever Oh, no, I, or, I wasn't or not travel, but, uh, yeah, uh, go ahead. I, I didn't mean from our expense. I'm talking about the line item for commission. I mean, we, oh, rent, I we rent a golf cart or something for one of I the parades. You. It comes out of the commission budget line. I I'm not talking about individually coming from our each accounts. It's, I it's wouldn't even mind for that. The, for the inter however, it needs to be done. But to me, there needs to be structure to this. We're forming something new, and there needs to be some structure to it. So I would like to see um, coming back with the other when we're talking about all the other materials that are done for recognition, some kind of how often we're going to, I mean, suppose somebody hands out 100 of them within six months. And they're done. Mm -hmm. They have no more. We discussed that. We did. We for what time it. frame? A year. Mm -hmm. A year. Fiscal year. Absolutely. So 500 of them can go out in one year. Mm -hmm. All right. To me, that needs to be written down so that mm -hmm. in the future, somebody's not questioning that it's written yeah. down 150 of each per year and then it's replaced or replenished, I should say, the next year. Can I ask that you make an amendment to my motion to include those things that staff bring back uh, within the next ordinance, uh, that policy, and then that will just play part and parcel to what I just said. Okay. Uh, I'll make an amendment that when do you want to say something? Yeah, it's, I think it's two totally different motions. I think it should be a separate motion because okay. that has to do with a totally different. Okay, you got item. it. Thank you, City Clerk. Seeing no other speakers, we'll go ahead and call the vote. And that passed four to one with McDowell dissenting, and that vote is a no. It's actually a hell no vote. Thank you. Okay, now we'll go on to the amended uh, next motion. Uh, I'll make a motion that uh, staff bring back, when they bring back about the uh, proclamations, key to the city and that, because this is an honor that's being done or being handed out, that there be a procedure of how these coins are distributed and then how they are recouped back and also how they're going to be paid for. I. What are you thinking? I'm thinking just to put those three things that you said, as in 100 a year during a fiscal year, 50 of each design goes to each uh, commissioner, that the expense comes out of the commission's budget, and that the uh, coins, uh, the balance of coins unused are returned at the end of each term, period. And then that way there's no question of what's in that I'm going to withdraw my motion. Go ahead and make a motion. <laughs> <laughs> Best way to do it. Okay. Uh, move to uh, direct staff to come back within the uh, already current policy uh, being drafted for resolutions. Uh, and such to come back with a coin policy that dictates that each commissioner will be allowed uh, uh, 100 a year coins with 50 of each design total to be given out at their discretion. Number two is that the expense of these coins come out of the commission budget. And number three, that any unused coins uh, during that time frame are returned at the end of each commissioner's term. I'll second. Motion on the floor by Commissioner Carrison, uh, City Clerk. Did you capture? Thank you. Um, seconded by uh, Vice Mayor. Anything to that, Commissioner? I think that it was exactly what Commissioner Luke is saying, and I think it's good to have something. She makes an absolutely great point. It could be that 
someone hands out a hundred and then within a month wants to reorder another hundred and I think it's important to have that as part of that that resolution however we bring it back thank you and vice mayor uh, accountability should be on anything that we handle in the positions that we're in uh, just like the shirts that we order we stipulated how many shirts how often the shirts and things like this this is something that we're utilizing as individuals so I think an accountability and a process was definitely necessary for this also thank you Seeing no other comments um, my only other comment is I would have rather seen the 250 instead of the 500, but as I said, I'm a compromiser. Um, while, while I am totally against uh, challenge coins and my vote reflected that on the one motion, now that that passed, um, I am very grateful that there's going to be at least a policy put into place so that I can support. So we'll go ahead and take the vote. And that passed five to zero. May I make one more comment? Sure. Having these um, coins, does that, does that mean that a commissioner has to utilize them? If somebody does not feel as though they should, they do not have to receive any from the clerk's office. I'll pay them all. Just have them sit and collect dust in my office if I have to get them. I agree. I think we have a lot of things that are given away at the end of the year they're just kind of put in a storage facility and i think that um you bring a good point up because if there's a balance at the end of that year then the reorder should be reduced from that exactly. balance and that's exactly something right. maybe we can bring up when that maintaining ordinance comes. the money yep so I'm maintaining qu quantity of 100 per commission or whatever that may be all right, I see no other business on the agenda. Praise the Lord. Uh, any public comment cards? There are none. Thank you very much. Um, so now we'll move on to commission communications. Commissioner Emmerich? I have none. Uh, Commissioner Carousel? No, thank you. And Com Vice Mayor Luke? Yes. Um, the Art Center reached out, wanted me to let all of you know that on March 20th at 6.30, they're going to have a take me out to the ball game um, event, a gallery showing, and they wanted to make sure every commissioner was invited to that. Uh, personally, I would like to see an update on Legacy Trail. I saw uh, a thing written up of how a lot of ac action was going on up in North County, so I would like to know what's happening down here for hmm. us, too. It was just like one sentence. Yeah, they're working on North Fork Connector. So I would actually like to see an update. Didn't we give direction to have the city manager reach out to county administrator for quarterly updates? I don't know. I don't remember exactly when that was. But I have I to go back we, and look at the CM report. I don't, I don't remember. Yeah, I thought we gave that direction for a quarterly reports. We must be either getting very close to it or we've already passed it. So I... I if they can get us an update, that'd be great. Do we need a consensus for that? Well, we already gave them a consensus to give us updates. I'd have to look at the same report. I don't remember. So we'll do it again to make sure it's on the record again. Yes. Yes. Update for Legacy Trail? Yes. Yes. Okay. We will do it. I want to give kudos and thank you to uh, Gulf Coast Community Foundation. In a memo format or some other format? Memo's fine. Memo. Memo's fine. I just want to make sure we're not being forgotten in the money spent before the two million gets allocated to us. Do we want to give a time frame? No, I'm sure they'll get it done. We need to find out possible. where we're at. It's possible that, like you said, it's a week away from the quarterly mm -hmm. report. So, uh, I'm giving kudos to the community count, uh, Gulf Coast Community Foundation. Uh, they saw a picture that was posted with the old um, civility squad, and we got some hanging back here, and they're like, oh my goodness, those are so old. Mm -hmm. So they offered to supply material. So all around Mullen Center, Morgan Center and stuff, you will see the new 
uh, material posted, so thank you to them. Uh, I want to say thank you to Lee Gross, uh, who first wrote all of the commissioners and the city manager in regards to emergency processes for this coronavirus. Uh, we didn't really have within, you know, our disaster plans or whatever for these types of emergencies. So we were able to get started right away on, on it and the city has really uh, rolled in and got everything addressed and taken care of. I'm wondering if we want to send a thank you to the Florida League of City Executive Director, Michael Stidick. Uh, he is retiring, so I thought maybe as a city we could just send a letter of gratitude to him for, I mean, it's years that he's been in there as the executive director, so I'm wondering if we could get a consensus to send a thank you to him before he's gone. Yes. 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 Uh, the Sumter welcome sign out on Sumter and 75 when you're coming in, I was told that probably by the end of January it was going to be all lit. I just got another email from a citizen saying that is still not lit and welcoming as you come in on Sumter, so just give an alert to staff for that. And then just so proud of our Panther Girl softball. Um, they are doing so well in holding tournaments. Uh, coming up in the first uh, week in April, there's going to be 149 teams in the city of Northport for girls softball. And these coaches are just so excited about doing this. They've even gone out and bought their own windbreaker with their logo and everything on it to make these fields look really good. Kudos to the county for <coughs> making those fields look good. So thank you very much. I'm done. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Commissioner Hanks? Um, I only have three of them. Um, from my understanding, Assistant City Manager, that the community yard sale for April was canceled. Um, I know that I asked about it and she'll tell you what I know because of the holidays there there's a lot of holiday stuff happenings and I'm going to defer to Parks and Rec Thank you. Uh, Sandy Funhiller Parks and Recreation Director there was no uh, uh, event that was canceled it just wasn't scheduled in April it was scheduled in March generally we do try to do four a year this year we did three because we weren't able to do one in November because of the number of events that were already scheduled for Parks and Recreation. So we put it out in our playbook with the dates um, and um, try and have it at different times of the year, but it was never scheduled in April this year. Okay, so what, what months are they scheduled? Generally, I would say, I think it's October, November, which we didn't have this year, and then a February and a March. In the past, it, there's been one in April, but this year it was not scheduled that way. Um, so we had, we had um, Easter weekend that we had to work mm -hmm. around and a couple other events that we were doing in April. Gotcha. So this coming November, are they? Are you planning to hold a community yard sale this November 2020? Uh, I don't, I'm not positive. I have to look at our, our annual schedule. Our, our current playbook does not go through November, so I need to look at what we have scheduled in the system. Because um, I had I had a citizen that had asked about having a community yard sale in November as probably something similar to a pre-holiday sale. Sure. Um, because it, this community yard sale isn't just yard sale, but there's vendors that are selling their wares and stuff like that, that too. Sure. Um, but maybe what we could do is also have you guys figured out dates for your um, artesian market, the maker's market. Maker's when market. We, we are ready to pull the trigger on that. We are just waiting for uh, neighborhood development to finish up their process as far as bringing, um, it's, I guess it's a license or a permit that we decided that, that they would need to get. Once they have that in place, we are ready to pull the trigger on scheduling the first one and then have the process for Northport residents and then non-residents to register. So that'll be another option 
Mm -hmm. um, do you have an idea when that maker's market m off the top of my head no I, I can look it up for you we have what we think we're going to do but we're just kind of waiting to make sure that NDS is ready um, and has a good process in place before we start advertising and promoting it okay I think your reply to all these questions to me was like Aprilish, and I pass that on to the citizen Keep There's, an eye out for it. I, I think I think when we discussed in commission meeting, there was a 90-day advance um, registration. It was 90 days for Northport residents, and then 80 days for non-residents. So if that's the case, we just have to work that into the timeline. Um, I received this um, this brochure and information about the mayor's play ball event. Um, it's an event that they partner up with the Major League Baseball, the mayors, and Little Leagues. It's a play ball kind of thing. And what caught my eye is, in the past, we've done this. So I said to city manager, what did we do in the past? I don't ever remember seeing anything. And he said, no, we, as the city of Northport, has never done anything with play ball. So I am wondering if this is something that we would like to consider, considering that we have so many little leaguers here. We have um, a lot of people that do like to play ball, and not just the little leaguers, but I believe that even Parks and Recs has some kind of a, a baseball type um, activities. So um, I, I would like to see if this is something that Parks and Rec would like to do, or if they need commission direction to look into it. Um, so, um, if, if we're wanting to do the event this, something this year to recognize it, um, it may be a little difficult to get done this year since we didn't plan for it, we didn't budget for it. Um, if we could incorporate it into an existing event maybe, um, that would be a possibility. I do know that it is a, um, I believe it's a partnership <coughs> through the city and also the Boys and Girls Club. So um, that would be us working with them, um, bringing them into the fold. Um, it would make a lot of sense to do it next year as part of the big rally if we're going to do that event annually now. And then um, we could probably also work it into um, any number of the events next year. I think it has to be done between April and um, September. Right. There, there's a specific time frame. There's a proclamation. Um, there's a pledge that you take. And um, there's a couple of different things. Could I get some information on this? I don't know anything about it. Yeah. I'll, I'll, all I got is just copy it. So I'll, I'll give it to city clerk to disperse. Um, maybe we could even work with um, the Braves or the Fire Fire Frogs, you know, because that's more their season. The Braves are very very busy with what they need to do, but it's MLB, maybe Fire Frogs. I, I'm just throwing out ideas on, mm -hmm. on participation and things. So um, it came in the mail, and I wanted to ask about it. Okay. So I, I think we can definitely plan for it for next year work it into the big rally, work with um, local uh, Little League uh, and the Braves, um, and then the Boys and Girls Club, bring, bringing them all together for that event. Fantastic. Do you, City Manager, do you need any direction from us, or is this something we'll talk about maybe again at budget time? I think it's something we need to have a conversation at budget time. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. If, I'll uh, put it in my little budget it. book. Um, other than that, that's all I have. Mayor, Mayor, I forgot. I did have one thing, and I just forgot. Go ahead. You're not allowed to forget. <laughs> I know, apparently. Um, no, I, I have been noticing consistently just on um, social sites, and I and I always uh, I just I mean I've never been reached out to directly, but I always just disregarded it as a uh, outlier. Um, but more and more, I'm starting to see folks say uh, that they're being instructed they need a permit for an eight by eight shed to put mm -hmm. in their yard. Um, even right here, uh, somebody was said, no, that's not true. And he said, no, I just went in this week, this last week, and they told me it required a permit. The law changed a couple of years ago. And I just wanted to make sure that, that, our, that, our, that our staff understands that we have a, you know, that there's a new, uh, there's new law in town. And uh, you don't have to have those things. We actually released a lot of those regulations for that. And um, I was also wondering, like, how, how is it? I mean, how do we let staff know? Do, I mean, I mean, do we send out we, we send out memos to everybody, right? Or is it on our permitting? Uh, uh, you know, when they come in, you know, when somebody comes in and we pull up the permit, is that something that is on the permit so that way we don't miss it and forget? 
just kind of wondering that process. Thank you. These are good questions. I'll uh, defer to Frank Miles, uh, the Director for Neighborhood Development Services. Yes, for the record, uh, Frank Miles, Director of Neighborhood Development Services. And yes, Commissioner, uh, that information is required on all permits, on our website, all of our uh, outreach material. Uh, every uh, shed requires permits. Uh, that is a requirement and um, I will make sure that staff is properly informing whoever. That under 100 square foot, it does not require. Under 200. Or under 200 square yes. foot, that it does not. So on the permit, it still says that it does, and that's maybe the problem we're running into, you're saying? Well, I'll take a look at what the, exactly what the issue is, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll get an answer to you. Yeah, okay. if, if no one's directly re reached out to me, but, I, but I've noticed more and more, it's getting more and more common that I'm seeing <coughs> these complaints. So Because we, we said that they wouldn't need a permit um, under 200. It may not be, I think it's the not the right of use. Now, there may be other other areas that they're, you know, other, yeah, if it's. Uh, Nicole Gailhouse, for the record. Um, I believe the ordinance that was passed recently, um, it exempts out the um, public works portion of the permit Probably. review and those fees. It doesn't exempt everything from a permit. Uh, okay. All right, so what permits would be required if I wanted to put up a, a 100 square foot shed? Um, you would you would need a shed permit um, that would require a zoning and um, depending that, on the size that of it. That goes against the every the entire intent uh, of everything we intent. were wanting to do. If I could clarify, what y'all were concerned about was allowing put, putting sheds up in the right of way and us charging fees for Correct. these temporary sheds. You never delved into the whole uh, fee structure for for the the sheds. If y'all want to do that, we can we can pull that. Yeah. Oh. Put that on a future agenda, but that's not what y'all. No, that's all, not what you dived into. This all started with the fact that a shed under two hundred square two feet was ago. charged oh, yeah. for permitting. That's how it. In all city right away. It, it was the right of way yeah. use permit. No, it was the right of way. Mm -hmm. And then it was the right of way on top of it. Mm. They. I can look. Okay, so I was probably the last one that pulled the permit that was the full permit with the right of use the shed. Um, and if I remember correctly, there is still a shed permit required to make sure it's being placed in the correct spots. That's correct. But you, you, you obviously, during the budget process, you'll be reviewing all the city fees. And if y'all want to do go in a different direction, Let me just I might see what this guy said took place. When, I, uh, when looking for a shed permit at City Hall, they informed me that I needed a permit from the permit committee to ask questions about the shed permit. The permit committee fee was $250 plus $5 per word, including spaces, and they meet between 10.30 and 10.45 once a month. If the pre-permit committee oh, approves you for right. such, such permit, you must add the engineer fee of $500 and the $300 in materials and the additional $69 fee, meaning my 64 square foot shed could be $1,000. The best part is I still have to build it myself. Yeah, it doesn't sound right. That doesn't sound yeah, right at all. Yeah, right there. Where that's from. Sounds it sounds like, like he's talking about the planning and zoning board. That's what I was. He may be HOA. talking yeah, about. It almost sounds like an HOA. Yeah, that sounds that, like he's uh, constructing it instead of it being pre-made, pre which we well, were talking about. Well, that's different. Now, yeah, now that's different. Yeah. Ours were prefabbed with certain con conditions. Yeah. And maybe it is in an HOA that has those kind of requirements that are outlined in there. Right. So, th but that being said, this, this is not the only one I've seen. So maybe we can just take a look and see what the process. Sure, certainly, we'll, look we'll be uh, happy to do that, and then we'll prepare a memo to get to the city manager to provide to you all exactly what's required. So we had a big discussion and went through all this probably six months ago. And in looking at the code language in section 70-24. It's an exception that no right of way use permit is required to erect a shed. So this 200 square feet or less in area is prefabricated, et cetera. You still have to have a, a permit, though. Mm -hmm. And I think it's like a $40 permit. I don't know the exact cost, but it, it's not. It's not. It's not $1,000. Yeah, right. No. Exactly. All right. Nine ninety nine. dollars 99 to that memo because uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, any other commission communications? Okay, Assistant City Manager. Yes, Just two quick things. Um, n number one, I, um, there's a lot of discussion going on about uh, coronavirus-19. Um, just so you'll know, your staff is in constant contact with the uh, county uh, emergency management officials as well as 
uh, sister uh, uh, cities in regards to uh, coordination of this. Um, the county's in constant contact with the state of Florida and the Center for Disease Control. Uh, the bottom line is people stay calm, wash your hands. If you are sick, uh, don't go out in public and don't go to work. Um, but uh, a lot of extra hysteria is being generated on this topic. But the bottom line is, is stay calm and wash your hands. And don't touch your, don't touch your eyes, your nose, and your mouth with unwashed hands. Um, uh, the, the mortality rate on this thing is just slightly more than, than what you would see with a normal flu season. Flu season kills 30,000 people a year. So uh, just, just put everything in perspective and remain calm. Uh, number two, um, City Manager Lear wanted me to send a thank you to all the staff members and the community for stepping up during this time of need for the blood drive. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a testimony to how special Northport as a community is. And uh, just wanted to say thank you to, to everyone stepping up. Uh, city Attorney. Northport Mayor. As interim proposed city clerk. I do have one thing. Um, the youth council board, is, they were supposed to present to y'all on March 25th, and their staff liaison has asked for direction to allow them to have a joint meeting with you instead. So if I could schedule that. that. March 25th? March 24th. They were supposed to come, they were supposed to present at the regular meeting, but they'd feel more comfortable just doing a joint meeting with the commission. So I just wanted to get direction to be able to schedule a joint meeting with them. Not on March 24th, on a different I was day. Saying. Okay. Uh, I have no problem with it. Uh, I'd much rather have a joint meeting. That's what a, a joint meeting is what you were asking, yes. correct? Okay, so for a joint Timing, meeting. I don't know about, but yeah. Um, a joint meeting with the Youth Advisory Board, Commissioner Hanks, yes. Vice Mayor. Yes. I'm a yes, Commissioner Carousel. Yes. And Commissioner Emmerich. Yes. Thank you very much. So there's your consensus to uh, schedule a joint meeting with the Youth Advisory Board. I would love to hear what they're, they've been doing. Is there anything else? Alrighty, it is now 1.59 and we are adjourned. <laughs>